June 14th, 2021. We're here in Studio 2 at Sunset Sound. We're joined by Jeff Jampel. Wisdom comes from good judgment. Would you like to carry on with the rest of that? Sure. That's, that's my company mantra is wisdom comes from good judgment. Good judgment comes from experience. And experience comes from really bad judgment. So as I've told clients, I'm probably one of the most experienced guys you'll meet. Yes. In life, business, music, everything. When we started doing this about six months ago, having you know people associated with the studio, music, of the studio, everybody said, you got to get Jeff Jampol. Hmm. Not only because you manage the estates of The Doors, Janis Joplin, obviously famous artists that you know have passed through these halls and rooms, but your personal story is so motivating and so unbelievable and it's inspiring. You were born in Los Angeles. Yep. You're an LA kid. What's it mean to be from Los Angeles? Uh, I mean, I don't know what it, what it means to not be from Los Angeles. Touche. Uh, you know, LA, look, LA is the epicenter of so many parts of pop culture, you know, uh, it's certainly a part of six of the sixties. It's certainly a part of uh, the social renaissance of the 60s. It's certainly a huge part of film and television. Um, it's a, now becoming a large part of uh, fashion and a gastronomy. Um, it's becoming like, you know, the left coast yeah. and holding its own with New York. But L.A. always had its own separate ethos and zeitgeist. Um, you know, it, it's one of the reasons I find so much inspiration in Jim Morrison's lyrics, because he spoke of it so eloquently, I couldn't even begin to approach. So I'll just let his lyrics speak for L.A. Yeah, wow, that is true. I, I grew up in Chicago, but The Doors were the first rock band at like 12 years old. Ray Manzarek was from Chicago. My dad was a, yep. worked with Buddy Guy, and that was, that was the first band I loved. And when I heard When the Music's Over, I was like, oh, my gosh, this is something different, even at my age. And what you do now is somewhat similar to what I'm trying to do with the studio is just revive it and make it um, not only accessible, but entertaining to the new generations coming up. There's bands that come in here that are 20 years old. They don't even know who the Doors are. They're in Studio One. Doors, Buffalo Springfield, Janis Joplin, Beach Boys. They maybe know Rage Against the Machine or something, but turning these people back on has got to be a constant struggle for you. How do you entertain and market the Doors in today's climate when the record labels only market to pop culture? This took me 20 years to figure out. Um, I think it's funny because I've seen a lot of people come into this space of trying to manage legendary artists or iconic artists, and, and they keep going down in flames. Um, and I don't think my success is because I was that smart or that bitching. I actually, th I know it's because I had a secret weapon that no one else had, which is that I had been partners with Danny Sugarman. Yep. And Danny knew everything. Really? I mean, Danny had worked for The Doors since he was 13 years old. 12, I thought. 12 and a half, somewhere in there, yeah. <laughs> Incredible. Um, somewhere really, really young. And had been with The Doors his entire lifetime and took over managing them in the 70s. Uh, and when Danny and I had first partnered, he was, you know, singularly focused on The Doors, um, as was I. But I have a good friend of mine, Wayne Kramer, who has this great quote. Which is, and he always says to me, Jeff, he says, unfortunately, self does not reveal self to self. And so I think what happened is once Danny and I were able to partner up, we were then able to hold up really efficient and effective mirrors for each other. And uh, you know how sometimes you can see a flaw or a problem in somebody else and you could, you could run everybody's life except your own? Because mm -hmm. self doesn't reveal self to self, right? We yeah. need some outside input. And so I needed outside input and Danny needed outside input. And once we joined forces and held up those mirrors for each other, um, the Doors business exploded. And coming into it, I suffered from what I call Jackson Pollock syndrome, which is something everybody that enters this space I've seen suffer from. And Jackson Pollock syndrome is kind of like when you take a kid to see a Pollock drip painting at MoMA and you turn to him and you go, you could do that. You know, and I looked at the doors and I went, I could do that. But unfortunately, the chief symptom of Jackson Pollock syndrome is you don't have a fucking clue that you don't have a fucking clue. And so I thought, oh, I could do this, but I couldn't do it. But I had no idea I couldn't do it. Yeah. Again, Danny became the thing between my gun and my foot and kept me from shooting myself in the foot and going over the edge of the cliff and pulled me back enough hundreds of times that I was able to stay alive and the lights started to come on. And once they started to come on, they really started to come on in droves. 
And I, I went to Danny one day, and, I, and you know, the doors business had literally exploded. We went from selling, at that time, about 300, 350,000 CDs a year to over one and a half million. Um, our publishing business had increased over 500%. Our, our merchandise and apparel business had, had uh, increased over 800%. Wow. It was crazy, and I thought, this can't be right. But it was, and that was one of the first lessons, which is these iconic legacies People use the word brand, which I hate, although it is a, you know, it's a vending term. And I guess we are in the vending business because music business, you know, it's two words. But I prefer the term legacy, uh, but a rose by any other name. Anyway, um, these legacies to me are like these 428 cubic inch Cobra super jet engines that are just sitting there idling. And they're super powerful and they have gobs of horsepower. And all you have to do is provide a transmission to put rubber to road. And when that happens, the, the, the results that you get are just out of this world. And when I saw it happen with the doors, I went to Danny one day and I was like, Danny, like, if this works this well for the doors, why would this not work for Led Zeppelin or David Bowie or the Who or the Beach Boys or anybody? And he gave me this blank look. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, Jim Morrison had taught Danny how to read drink, eat, screw around. Um, you know, he gave Danny his entire bibliography. Um, and Danny was like the biggest Doors fan in the world. He never really looked beyond that. And I said, Danny, I, th I think we're on to something here. Why, let me, let's go, out, let's go after Janis Joplin. It's the same kind of cultural wheelhouse, same time, both in California, Northern and Southern, obviously. I said, okay. And I started talking to the Joplin estate and unfortunately, sadly, and unfortunately, Danny passed away in January of 2005 uh, from brain and lung cancer. He had, wow. he had suffered from lung cancer and beat it several times, and it Smoking? finally just came back. He was a smoker. And uh, right when we signed, the, he had just passed away weeks before we signed the Joplin Estate, wow. um, which was in, again, 2005. And then the same thing happened with Joplin. The same explosion on a smaller scale, not as many zeros, um, and then I thought, okay, we were right. We were right. And, and Janis Joplin was actually, I, th I think as far as, as far as I can recall, Janis Joplin was the last artist that we actively went after. Every single artist, uh, subsequent to that came to us wow. because word started to spread, right? And we started to get really good at what we're doing. And we built this really great team of people, um, that I was able to train because it's such a specialized position. You know, and uh, everybody, everybody that, that came into it that I hired had Jackson Pollock syndrome, which I couldn't be mad at because, again, I had it. I was just lucky enough to survive it. Did Jesse have Jack Jackson Pollock syndrome? Um, not as much. <laughs> not as much. Shout out Jesse Nasita. We love him. Yeah. No, Jesse had had a, a, a deep background in film and television and sports world. Yeah. And he knew a lot of that. But he, Jesse was smart enough to know what he didn't know. And he was smart enough to kind of just shut up and listen. And that puts you miles ahead. What are the fundamental, fundamentals of a good music manager? Let's, let's bifurcate it. And then in so doing, we'll address your previous question, which is how do we market these artists? Well, what does a music manager do for those people that don't know? So a music manager is um, kind of like uh, the coach of, of a ball team, right? The artist is the owner. And as the manager, you have to put together a winning team um, at the behest of the owner. And the owner gets to make all the shot, call all the shots and make all the decisions. And then and the manager, kind of our coach, brings it to him and says, we need this guy, we need to do this, we need to spend this much on this. Um, it's really the best analogy. And so the team of an artist, you know, it kind of looks like um, there's a guy at the, at the center as the manager. And then you have the agent who's responsible for all live performances. And then you have the business manager who is an accountant who takes care of the money in the books and settling, et cetera. Um, and then you may have a publicist, you may have a merch guy, um, you may have a lawyer. Um, you know, you can have several members of the team. You can have licensing reps. Um, but the manager is basically the quarterback that's, that's, or the coach that's, you know, kind of sending in the plays. Yeah. And you, in your background, 
is in managing. I, when you came in a few weeks ago to have lunch with us, it's a great day, and uh, our studio manager remembered you from the '80s from coming <laughs> to Sound Factory, and you were yeah. managing clients over there. Let's. Yeah. I, I really want to learn about you, so let's rewind to college. You drop out. You're enamored with music and live performance. How did you step into managing? How did you even hear about it? Was there a mentor there, or did you just realize you wanted to work with bands? You know, it's funny. I never had a mentor. I had several quasi-mentors along the way who would dispense really great advice or take me under their wing for short periods of time, but nobody that I actually ever worked with or worked for that showed me the ropes. It was all DIY. Um, Trial and error? Yeah. A lot, a lot of both. <laughs> a lot of both. A lot of discouragement? Sorry to... um, well, there's this inbred fear. Like, I don't know what I'm talking about, and they're going to find out. It's a little bit of imposter syndrome, Yeah. which at the beginning is not a syndrome because you are an imposter. Yep. Right? But there's still, I mean, think about, like, what a crazy music fiend and fanatic I was. My first sexual experience was listening to Lover Madly on the radio while it was going on. Wow. Um, and Honky Chateau. Uh, Honky Cat. Um, I still remember that. I mean, I, I guess like most of us do. Um, my first little sailboat that I bought was named uh, Ship of Fools. Talking to John and Robbie later, they had a boat with Jim that was called Ship of Fools. That's cool. But, you know, the Doors were like my idols. They're one of my favorite bands ever. And, and by age 9 or 10, you know, I knew every band. I knew the genealogy. I knew quantitatively and qualitatively why Black Sabbath was better than Deep Purple and can run it down for you <laughs> and give you a defensive argument on both sides. Um. And I just was always that kid. And I was in college really early. And I just, I loved music. It was my rope to sanity, the lyrics, the presentation. You know, I was the weirdo, loner, outsider, short, fat, non-athletic, Jewish loser guy with horrible self-esteem. Um, I was suffering from the disease of addiction, although I didn't realize it. And, uh, you know, it's funny, one of the, one of the things I learned in, in my sobriety and in, in, in the recovery and the counseling work I do is that drugs and alcohol don't cause addiction, right? They treat addiction. So I still, I had the disease of addiction long before I ever tried the first drug or drink. Explain that. So you're compulsive like with anything you were doing? Um, well, the disease of addiction, you know, the AMA figured it out in 1956. Um, but the disease of addiction has three hallmark symptoms, which is it is progressive, it's incurable, and it's fatal. Um, and there are several other diseases in that class, like um, certain forms of leukemia, diabetes, AIDS. Um, but like diabetes and AIDS, uh, addiction is treatable. It's just not curable. Um, and, you know, if you're an addict, you have that disease, again, long before you have the first drink or the first drug. So whether... Something environmental happened to me or some trauma happened to me that I can't recall or it was from birth. I, I had it. And I'm telling you this all retrospectively. I didn't realize at the time. At the time, I just thought, I'm a loser. It was a grandparent uh, hereditary is obviously a big cause of it, too. You know, if a There was no addiction in my family whatsoever. No. Wow. Um, except my younger brother and I were both um, really obese. Like when I finally got sober, I weighed 425 pounds. Holy cow. Um, and had been a fat kid since I was eight or nine. So trapped in that chubby body with zero self-esteem and knowing that I was a fuck up and a loser, but the music, man, the music kept me alive, you know? I mean, when I first heard Ziggy Stardust, and that was a whole thing, I mean, I, oh my God, I just, that was my guy. Bowie was my guy. Mm. And then when I went to see that concert, the Ziggy Stardust tour, I saw it, uh, Twice, once at um, Santa Monica Civic and then later at Long Beach Arena. Um, but I ended up in college, I was very young. I had graduated high school at 15. And I had to get into a special college for, quote, gifted kids, unquote. I don't necessarily think I was that gifted, but I was probably gifted at convincing people I was gifted, which bodes well for manager. So I was building my <coughs> tools early. Um, and I got into college radio. And oh my God, what a world. And that was amazing. And I ended up working as like a gopher for this brand new band that was starting called Pablo Cruz. Um, I discovered cocaine in college. Wee! Uh, and I ended up dropping out after about a year and a half to um, deal blow and to manage punk bands. Were you doing cocaine daily at that point too? Yeah. Just blowing through grams every day. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, that's why I took up dealing, right? Yeah. I was my own best customer. <laughs> um, but I had, I had had this experience at that Bowie concert, actually. I had this series of three catharses that happened that evening that literally changed the course of my life. Um, and I, you know, my pursuit of rock and roll and my love for rock and roll um, was poo-pooed by a lot of uh, authority figures. And I know this is antithetical to everything I stand for today and believe in and goes against every ounce of my fi and fiber of my being. But when I was a kid, for some reason, I still can't understand it, I bought into the idea of authority. And if you were a parent or a teacher or an adult or grown up, if you said something, I just didn't question it. And I used to get shamed for my love of rock and roll. And, and adults would take me aside and like, why are you spending so much time with this this, you know, something that was less than worthy. And why are you not studying Cezanne or Beethoven or Shakespeare, something worthy? And so that just caused a little bit of further shame. And, and I was kind of having to do it in the dark and in secret. Um, and again, I was just this total weirdo loner outsider. You know, I had skipped a bunch of grades. So the kids my age were years, um, were years behind me and the kids in my grade were years ahead of me. My parents had been divorced. My father was not around the house. My two older brothers were eight and 11 years older. They were gone. So I really had no male peers to bounce shit off of. Um, but I, I, I was so into that Ziggy Stardust album and nobody here knew who Bowie was. Um, and I was leafing through the paper one day in the LA Times and there was this quarter page ad in the bottom right and it said, Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars are coming to the Santa Monica Civic. I'm like, oh, no fucking way. And I knew this girl, Lulu, in high school. And Lulu was 17, blonde, really cute, but really abstract. So all the guys left her alone. Um, and I speak abstract fluently, so Lulu and I were completely bonded. But the key was Lulu was 17, so she had a driver's license and a 72 Mercury Capri. Nice. Metallic green, tan interior. And I became like her A&R guy for her album selections. And she became my chauffeur for wow. our rock and roll adventures. And I called her one day and I was like, okay, Lulu, Ziggy Stardust tour. It's coming to Santa Monica Civic. I'm getting tickets. You're driving. We'll buy loose joints outside. She's like, who's David Bowie? I was like, it doesn't matter. It's not an option. I'm not asking. I'm telling you, this is what we are doing. Yeah. She's like, all right. So we went to that concert, drove down from Ventura, um, bought a loose joint outside. And I walked in, and you know, Santa Monica Civic was this amazing temple for me. I mean, I had seen Queen open from out the hoople there. I had seen The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway tour with Genesis there. I had seen The Who there. I had seen like these amazing artists. And it only had, I think, like a 2200 capacity. Yeah. So there was 10 or 15 rows on the floor, and then a bunch of like 45 degree angled bleachers. And that was it. So every seat was phenomenal, but the floor seats were uber phenomenal. Yeah. And, um, I walked into my temple and the first catharsis hit me immediately, which is I looked around and there's 1900 other kids there just like me. It's like, I may be a weirdo freakazoid loner outsider, but I'm not the only one. Like this is my tribe. And I swear, I felt like this lightning bolt of energy zapped through all of us simultaneously. Was that one of your like first big concerts that you had been to? No, actually, this is, I, got a lot of, I got a lot of early indicators I should have paid attention to, which pointed yeah. to a career in management. Because my first concert was in 1969. Um, we had a babysitter, Linda Hawks. And I had convinced Linda Hawks to take me and two friends at age 11 and buy us a loose joint and take us to see Sly and the Family Stone at the Forum, Whoa. which she did. <laughs> um, so my, my managerial abilities were, in, in, were on point even then. So... No, Sly and the Family Stone was my first concert. Holy cow. But then, you know, I saw The Who. I saw The Stones in 72. I saw the 73 er, in Nicaraguan Earthquake Benefit. I saw Led Zeppelin. I saw a lot of great concerts. I Where mean, did you see Zeppelin, the forum? Yeah. Nice. Yeah, a couple times, and up in Northern California later. But the Ziggy Stardust show, Civic Auditorium, that show is so where boom. I really remember. Catharsis number one, I'm not alone. Here's my tribe. Yep. I couldn't see them before, but they're here. Uh, and then there was this whole thing that Bowie did before the concert, which was genius, which would take another half hour to talk about. But a curtain came up, and there's Mick Ronson, like platinum hair with his gold top Les Paul, and his like knees are bent, and he's just immediately in the hang on to yourself. And this is like, it's like, dun, 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 dun. and I'm like wow. losing my fucking mind. He's right there. 
And Bowie comes out from the side of the stage and he's like in this multicolored unitard with a, you know, swept back uh, copper pomp, you know, pompadour. And he's, he's crouched by the edge of the stage and he's rocking back and forth and he's singing these lyrics and they're hitting me like machine gun bullets. And I just realized in that moment, completely consciously, like what I am experiencing right now is fucking valid art. This is completely as valid as Cezanne, Shakespeare, or Beethoven. So all those motherfuckers have been lying to me. What else are they lying to me about? <laughs> Followed immediately by, you know, I'm never going to be that guy, and I'm never going to be that guy. Like, I had played guitar and bass since age five or six, and I figured out by age 10, I wasn't going to be that guy. Yep. Um, and I thought, I have to be as close to this as humanly possible. And I was like... I'm going to be a manager. I'm going to be a manager. I'm going to manage artists. I'll manage guys like that. And that was it. And like, I walked out of that concert with my eyes glowing red. And by age 15, I was managing a band in the Valley and, and then into college radio and then dropping out and managing punk bands in San Francisco. And I never looked back. Well, how did you get up to, so Central Coast is where you went to college, right? Northern California, Sonoma oh, State okay. University. Sonoma State. So then the nearest big city was San Francisco. Yeah. Was there something that attracted you to go to that city or was it just kind of... Yeah, I mean, San Francisco was like this bohemian den of freedom and art and expression and artists. And it was it was almost like a second renaissance, you know? Do you still um, think it is today? Oh, that's a really interesting question. I was just at Hyde Street two weeks ago, which yeah. is Wally Hyder's. Yeah, San Francisco to me is yeah. not the San Francisco I knew. Um, maybe the word renaissance does apply because it is being reborn as something else. Yeah. Um, doesn't necessarily appeal to me. Doesn't mean it's not 100% valid. Yep. It's just not my flavor. I'm right there with you. Um, but at the time, this is like 75, 76 San Francisco, you know, we were in the middle of this punk explosion. We didn't know it. And punk really happened in three cities. It was really San Francisco, New York, and London. Wow. Um, it kind of, I mean, LA, it touched. And we had the germs and we had, you know, a couple other bands. We had the mask. Um, and it touched some other cities, Detroit, it touched Atlanta. Um, but it really came out of San Francisco, New York, and London. I mean, it really was birthed in New York by the Ramones. Mm -hmm. And then McLaren was managing the Dolls and then went to London. Do you still uh, represent the Ramones? Uh, I, I used, no, I used to manage uh, the Johnny Ramone estate, okay. which is half of the Ramones. It's Johnny and Joey estates manage it, uh, run it collectively. Real, I got to interject one more thing. Uh, two weeks ago, Rodney Bingenheimer was in here. He's from up north, and he was really big in breaking punk bands on K-Rock in the 80s. And then also he was at that – he had picked up Bowie at the airport when he brought him in here and talked about – nobody really knew him, and he just knew that that guy was going to be insanely gigantic. Well, Rodney was right at the middle of a scene in Los Angeles in the 70s, right? Because he had opened a club called Rodney's English Disco. Mm -hmm. And Rodney was just really plugged in. And he had this personality that just vibed with the musicians. And like when Led Zeppelin was in town, that's where they hung out. You know, Elton John, that's where he hung out. Bowie, Mont the Hoople, um, Zolar X, Jabriath, Susie Quattro. <laughs> um, funny enough, you know, Lulu, who I was completely in love with, but I was 12 and she was 17, so that was never going to happen. I, I took her down to L.A. a couple times and turned her on to this whole scene of glam and then we were talking one day. She's like, yeah, I went to Rodney's English Disco. And I, the first thing I thought was, without me? Wow. Oh, my God, you went by yourself? She's, yeah, there was this guy there named Kim Fowley, and he called me a cunt, and I think I love him. And I was like, oh, <laughs> Lulu's gone. <laughs> I lost Lulu. Yeah. Uh, and then we saw Iggy and the Stooges at the Whiskey, and then she got kicked in the mouth by Iggy, and she also loved that. So I, know, I don't know whatever happened to Lulu, but she... Boy, she bought into that whole scene. But Rodney was a really intrinsic part of 70s glam rock in L.A. Was uh, Lulu up at in uh, NorCal with you ever in San Francisco? No, no. She was in Ventura where I had gone to 10th grade. Okay. I went to three different high schools. Where would you live in San Francisco? Uh, I lived all over the place. I lived at Anza and Stanion in the city. I lived in the East Bay near uh, up in the Oakland Hills. Um, I lived in Alameda, Alameda for a minute. I lived in Marin. Gotcha. Um, I lived in in um, Cupertino. Yep, I was all over. 
Yeah, I lived in Alamo Square and the Richmond District for a while, and I was just up there recently, and it was just a, it's a completely different place than 10 years ago when I was there. Uh, scary, filthy, dirty, just kids running around, homeless people, drug addicts everywhere. Um, You're kind of describing 1966 Haight-Ashbury. You know, well, it's kind of like the marketing of the summer of love. That wasn't even a term till the late 70s. They used it as a marketing ploy to talk uh, about that It was that before time. then, but yeah, well, as I've talked, I've had, I mean, listen, one of the greatest parts of my job is the stories that I hear and the discussions that I get to have. Sure. But in my discussions with Grace Slick and Yorma and the guys from Big Brother and Jack Cassidy, they all share some common observations. And one of them is that the summer of love, as it were, was really 65 and 66. By the time 67 came along, what happened was... 65, and actually, I'll tell you what really happened. What really happened was, and this is a story I've been really fascinated with, which is people know about the beats and the beat culture, and people know about the hippies and, and San Francisco culture, but they don't realize how they came together. Mm -hmm. And they all came together at one place. Because um, there was this author, there was this guy who lived up in Oregon who was a lumberjack, and he had written a book, a novel, um, that became a huge hit. It was called Sometimes a Great Notion. And that guy was uh, Ken Kesey. And with his money, he went down and he bought a ranch in Rio Hondo, which is a peninsula. Um, and then Jack Kerouac ended his on-the-road trip on the West Coast with Neil Cassidy. And Cassidy ended up staying with Ken Kesey at Rio Hondo. And you also have to remember that, uh, that acid was legal. Right, October 6th, 1966, that was the day that um, acid was made illegal. And there was a huge protest and a parade up the panhandle called the Death of the Hippie <laughs> on the day it was made illegal. But before then, you know, they were doing these acid tests and people were handing it out and it was this amazing drug. And um, giving it to prisoners too. That's where they, they were doing all kinds of things. And, and Ray Manzarek said something to me about acid. He said, Jeff, you have to understand. He said, when we wanted to get high, we smoked pot, we drank beer or whiskey. He said, acid was for education. Yep. Acid is a sacrament. It is not used to get high. It is used to open your mind and to get educated. Um, and so Ken Kesey started doing these acid tests. And he, there was this local bluegrass band in Palo Alto called the Warlocks. And he hired them. And they would play live music while everybody was on acid. And then they changed their name to the Grateful Dead. Um, and uh, Yorma and Jack were there. And then I guess there was a discussion. Obviously, I wasn't there. But there was a discussion with Jerry Garcia and, and Yorma and a couple other people. And they all realized there was this area of San Francisco, the hate, which was completely, like, um, abandoned. And buildings were boarded up. And it was almost like Hunter's Point became in the 70s and 80s. It was just oh, like wow. this ghetto. But there was these old Victorian mansions. And they said... We could like, we could rent like a 10, 15 room mansion for like a hundred bucks a month. We could all live there. And so the dead went and they rented a house at 710 Ashbury. Yep, I was just there. Jefferson Airplane rented one at 2400 Fulton Street. Big Brother and the holding company rented one at 1090 Pine. And they all moved in. And then I think it was Owsley, who was like the sound guy for the dead, who was also a prodigious manufacturer of LSD. Um, he and some guys discovered that they, they, or they, they had this tool that they could use to unscrew the base of a street, lamp, street light to get power. Oh, wow. And so all of a sudden they got Jeez. power. And so these bands started playing in the panhandle for free. It wasn't about money. It was about this cultural happening. And all these kids started coming, and then a couple of bodegas opened up, and then more people started coming, and then little clothing stores opened up, and then people started moving into the hate, and that is what kind of gave birth to that whole scene. Yeah. And then there was all these great San Francisco artists, you know, it was the Charlatans, and it was a Quicksilver Messenger Service, and later Moby Grape, and and then it just became this burgeoning scene, right? And then there was these guys who were involved in the area that started a free newspaper called the Oracle, and they called themselves the Diggers. Peter Coyote was one of those guys. Gregory Corso was one of those guys who was a very famous poet. Yeah. Um, and then this doctor started the Haight-Ashbury Free Clinic. And by 60, the end of 66, beginning of 67, the world discovered this. And all of a sudden, you know, the Beatles were coming there. 
And I had this great story from, from Jack Cassidy. He was, um, he about said, the uh, huh? About the Beatles? Well, he called me and he said, you know, he goes, I have my Jack Cassidy bass that I do with Epiphone. I said, yeah, I know it. And uh, it's this great semi-acoustic bass. And he said, you know, in the early 80s, they had done a couple prototypes left hand. And um, they decided they weren't going to make it because there wasn't enough call for that. And they just sent me the two prototypes. It's like 35 years later. Wow. He said, and they're beautiful. He goes, and the wood is phenomenal. And he said, I was thinking I'd like to gift one to Paul McCartney because I know he's a left-hand bass player. I said, okay, I can, I can reach out to his management. He goes, well, I kind of know Paul. <laughs> I said, you do? <laughs> he said, yeah. He said, Yorm and I were living in the hate. We had our own place. And... Uh, we got this call that, that, that um, the Beatles, that Paul and George were going to come to the hate. And Paul wanted to meet us. Holy cow. And that's what he said. And so he thought, oh, he probably wants to meet some real hippies. So I didn't even know if it was serious. Wow. And I guess he had talked to Mal Evans. And so they made this appointment. They, said, they talked to Yorma, you know, and they said, sure, invite Paul over. <laughs> and sure enough, knock on the door one day. Here's Paul McCartney in, in the middle, right at Sergeant Pepper, right? Um, and he goes, we sat and jammed and talked for two or three hours. And, uh, and so he goes, and then the next year, Paul invited me to London, and they were making um, the White Album. Holy shit. He said, and I went over and spent like a week or two with Paul there and watched them recording the White Album. I'm just like, oh, my God, my jaw's on the ground. I was like, okay, I get it. Okay, fine. <laughs> we'll, we'll get one of these bases to Paul. And we were actually making arrangements to do that, and then the pandemic hit. So I still have to call his manager. And Very cool. He was in here a few up. years ago, and he's every time I've seen him or heard of him being in a place, he's the kindest person ever. He goes around and meets everyone and talks to everybody here, went to all the techs, and, you know, is just a, a great person. Back to the punk music, what attracted you to punk music? Or was that just kind of what you fell into? Well, you know, I, I, the truth is that punk was what was happening. Gotcha. When I was there. Mm -hmm. So I just attached myself to whatever was happening. It's funny because music started to really change later in the 80s when I moved back to L.A. and I was really disillusioned and I couldn't connect with what was happening in the early and mid 80s. Um, but punk I completely connected to because punk was art. I mean, it was pure art. It was, it was conceptual art. It was performance art. You didn't need to be able to play an instrument that well, but it was about making a statement, and uh, I think it was co-opted and perverted quickly. But the initial germ and the initial seeds of that, you know, um, and we had heard about the Sex Pistols, and I went to see them at Winterland. It turned out to be their last show ever. Wow. Um, and I was like, okay, I get it. I totally get it. Yep. Um, and then I started managing these local bands, and I had been coming up as an engineer and a producer. Cause I didn't one know of, you engineered as well, sorry to cut you off. So you could run on a tape machine and a sound console? And oh, yeah. Every, I didn't know you engineered. Yeah. I, did you my dream was I was going to be either a manager or an engineer. Did you and work at a studio? I were, Well, what happened was I ended up going to school with this guy, um, Ragu. <laughs> Ragbeer Singadok, I remember. And then I started working in studios in San Francisco. In fact, I was lamenting to a friend the other day. I said, you know, I spent six months learning how to bias an Ampex MM1000. <laughs> six months. I'm never going to get back out of my life. Wow. Um, but yeah, I, I came up as an engineer and a producer. I was always in audio. I mean, I'm a okay. ridiculous, over-the-top, insane, should-be-imprisoned, probably-committed audiophile today. Um, I worked in audio for a long time. I worked selling audio in the 70s to supplant my punk habit, as it were, and other habits. Um, and I've always, I, I made my living for a while wiring recording studios. That's incredible. It's just endless soldering of cannon plugs and running wire. Just cannon plugs, running wire, cocaine. What was the peak of punk music, do you think? Uh, the peak was probably 78. Okay. And then Van Halen comes out, which we're in the room that five Van Halen's, 1976, Van Halen came in this room, did the demos, and then they blow up. Do you remember Van Halen kind of demolishing I do. punk? Well, I don't think it's that direct, right? I, like, I'm a quote monger. And one of, my, one of my favorite quotes is, correlation is not causation. Love it. Right? Um, 
and we love to correlate things in our business. We love to uh, imbue things with meaning, even when they have no meaning. Like I remember when Nirvana first broke and everybody was saying, oh my God, Seattle, Seattle's hot. You have to go sign Seattle bands and all these A&R guys descended on Seattle. And I was thinking, well, wait a minute. They are also a, they have a left-handed guitarist who's a lead singer and they wear black low top Converse sneakers. So is it, left-handed guitar playing singer bands or is it bands who all wear black low top converse or is it bands who all live in seattle because i think they're all equally ludicrous <laughs> um that may be correlation but it's not causation but one of the things i remember was i started working for cbs records and then atlantic records in 78 wow in san francisco um and the thing i remember and I could be off by six months or a year here, so don't quote me on the actual dates. But I look at artists that come out these days, and I've watched this for the last 20, 30 years, right? But if you, th 78, like 78 is not gonna be known as a banner year. It's not like 1976 Cabernets, you know? It, it's not, there were some good albums, right? But the debut records, the new artists that came out that year, the ones I can remember, it was uh, Van Halen. It was, um, it was The Pretenders. It was Ricky Lee Jones. It was The Cars. It was Boston. It, I mean, it could go on and on and on and on. These are all debuts. Foreigner. Were they I think earlier? Foreigner was earlier. Okay. Um, and Talking Heads had just come out yeah, they are the year before. Amazing. And Elvis Costello had just come out. Um, so that period of 76 to 78, and then capped by The Clash and Sex Pistols, and you had the damned, and you know earlier you had had the Ramones, but by '78, to me that was the pinnacle. Obviously, stuff was happening in '79, but really in '79, '80, it started to morph into new wave. And then this interesting thing happened, which is, um, you know, MTV started in 1981, and at that point, um, American labels never made short films, right? But European labels did. And all these European bands had these little short films that became known as videos. And so when MTV first started, that's all they had. They were like going to every label, give us what you have, give us everything, like this gaping maw of content, give me more, give me more. And the only artists that had these short films were European, and that's why all of these European artists started getting played on MTV. And that led to the whole new wave movement, and that led to the breaking of, you know, whoever, Duran Duran, The Fix, The Alarm, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's because they're just, the American bands didn't really have any. Yeah. I remember when I worked at CBS Records, I had bought this Ampex 1000, like big projection TV. And I checked out a three quarter inch uh, Betamax player. And, and we had this stack of three quarter inch videos in the office, but they were all f f uh, European bands, most of them through stiff records. And, um, I would take 10 or 15 home and I would call all my friends and we'd have a watching party. We'd bring food in and we'd watch these videos. And I remember it was Paul McCartney and, um, and all these, and a lot, all the stiff record stuff, Lena Lovitch and Ian during the blockheads. And uh, that was the start of video. Do you remember the first music video on MTV? Yeah. When when it was, was the it? Buggles video killed the radio star. Yeah. Wow. What were some of the bands that you were managing that were punk bands? Would we know any of them? Were they really, I doubt it. Um, <laughs> although there was this one guy who was an absolute genius who I'm still in touch with. We're still good friends, Andy Preboy. And Andy had this band called Eye Protection. First, the first band I ever managed, uh, aside from that one band in the Valley. I actually two bands here. Um, and Eye Protection was this really amazing punk band. Um, Andy later went on to become the lead singer of Wall of Voodoo. He replaced Stan Ridgeway. And then he went solo. Um, he, he was writing with Jeanette Napolitano. Uh, and I think he wrote a couple really key songs for, for them. Um, Did you know how to manage though? Or were you just kind of helping no, them? No, I had no gigs? idea. Because no, you didn't have a mentor. So you're just like. None of us had any idea, but they knew that I had no idea. But it's funny, Andy and I had dinner right before the pandemic. And I, I was like, Andy, I'm so sorry. He's like, what are you talking about? He goes, you had so much hustle and you had all these great creative ideas. I'm like, I did? <laughs> he's like yeah you remember this and i was like no he goes yeah and you did this and this and i was like wow i'm starting <laughs> to like myself more okay thank you so no but we had no idea it was yeah. all diy true diy 
What were your responsibilities? Booking them gigs at the same time and Everything. making sure the rent's paid yeah. and collecting the money and... Yeah, there was this uh, Hunter's Point at that point, where at that stage of San Francisco was this abandoned area, which was where Pac Bell Park is now. Yeah. Um, and it was this ghetto. It was a, and it was this, a, a, there's a great book or, or a movie in here, but um, there was this like eight story building in the middle of Hunter's Point, and it was this um, big meat storage facility where meat would be shipped in, and I guess it's into the San Francisco Harbor and would be stored here in this eight-story building. And there was all these different rooms that were um, insulated and refrigerated. It was like a complete refrigerated building that was completely abandoned. Yeah. And so some of these punk bands discovered it and broke in and bootlegged power. And they kind of, it was like this Lord of the Flies anarchy. And they all decided amongst themselves who's going to get which room and you had these great rooms which were completely insulated with like these 15 or 20 foot tall wood doors with, you know, corrugated steel. I still have a scar on the top of my foot because I remember one of the doors was stuck and we were trying to get it open. I kicked it and the corrugated steel caught my foot and just gouged in. But the, um, some of the band members lived there and we rehearsed there. I certainly slept there my share. Didn't get caught though? No. Because how, how would you not? The guys didn't, whoever did the meet didn't show up too much? I don't know how I didn't end up in prison or jail or dead <laughs> or with hep C or HIV. Um, I don't know why I still have my legs. I don't know why I'm, still li- why I'm still living. I got really, really, really lucky. I don't think I should be alive. Yeah. Um, but I also think that's a part of why I spend so much time working in recovery and volunteering and counseling. Um, because I want it to be an inspiration. I want people to know, you know, I know what it feels like to be hopeless, like truly hopeless, not just a word, completely permeating your psyche and where you know you're going to die. Um, and it becomes okay. And the goal becomes dying with the least amount of pain possible. And you can't get clean again and you can't dip detox and you're addicted to heroin and you're a loser and, and, and you're just a reject of society. Um, and there's no way back. And that's where I was. Yeah. And, and, to think about managing like some of my heroes and the artists that I get to work with, like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, I'm, I still have imposter syndrome. Like, they're gonna find out. I don't know who they are, and I don't know what they're gonna find out, but they're definitely gonna find out. Maybe that's why God intervened because He knew that you were gonna pay it forward when you did get sober. And how many people? I mean, we can talk about that later on. That your process of helping. Um, addicts right now and the time you spend doing that and uh, Bob Forrest even mentioned his I went to a concert with him actually to see Ryan Adams whose studio is here I had heard your name I think first through Bob Hmm. but maybe that's why uh, you know you don't you didn't get AIDS or hep C or die or have your leg cut off because God wanted to save you to put you to work clearly and I love it and you know we have a saying in recovery which is you can't keep it unless you give it away um, and I use, there are spiritual principles in recovery, and they talk about using these spiritual principles in all of our affairs, not just recovery, but also work and relationships. And I, my whole company is founded on those spiritual principles, which are ideals. You know, I, I fall short all the time. Um, but one of them is that you can't keep it unless you give it away. So, like, you know, all the, the teaching that I do at UCLA, I'm teaching people how to compete with me, you know. And uh, oh, wow. I, I, I'm happy to talk to managers or um, artists or estates or heirs anytime and tell them how to do the job and tell them how to how they can do stuff without involving us um, when was the first time so you're in San Francisco you're managing punk bands dealing using cocaine when's the first time you tried heroin well I remember that it was uh, it was this night in at Sausalito record plant Wow, one of my the most historical studios ever. Yeah, and that's where I had learned to do a lot of engineering. Um, I had a management company with Tony Kilbert, who was uh, one of the original DJs from KSAN. He was, he was this black guy, and everybody called him TK. Yeah, Tony Kilbert, and then he he uh, so TK and I and this guy Terry Delsing, and Terry was the manager of the record plant. Wow. Um, so I thought, you know, who better to manage than a DJ and a, and a manager of a record of a recording studio? Horrible decision, but uh, yeah. but they certainly knew more than I did. So maybe not so horrible. Maybe it was their horrible decision by teaming up with me. But we had this company together, and um, so I was able to go in there and 
and get a lot of studio time uh, on off hours and start recording and producing these bands. And I was kind of teaching TK how to produce and he and I produced together. Um, and Terry would provide the facilities and I was doing the engineering. We'd have a second. Um, but one night I was just hanging out and I think in studio A was Jim Carroll doing Catholic Boy. And then in studio B, I think Boz Skaggs was doing Down Two Then Left and wow. Toto was his backup band at that point. Yep. And we were all hanging out in Studio A, doing a bunch of blow. And whenever you do a bunch of blow, you usually like take Quaaludes, magical combination, by the way, um, or Valium or vodka and grapefruit juice was the drink du jour that night. And this guy came in with this little mirror and he goes, here, snort a line of this. I said, what's that? He goes, it's China White. And the second I heard that, I was like, China White, Keith Richards, heroin, fucking cool. Like that's what went through my head. I was like, okay. And I tried, did a line, puked my guts out. But after that, it was awesome. And I just thought, oh, I felt so outlawed. And I felt so enamored by this whole, I'm, here I am at, at Sausalito Record Plant, snorting China White, listening to Toto and, and Jim Carroll. Um, went back to my little hovel at Anzin Stanion, and I had met the dealer that provided it. And I would, started buying China White in tenths of a gram for like 120 bucks. For personal use. Yeah. Always for personal use. Yeah, you weren't dealing it, though, at that point. Yeah, yeah well, everybody tries to deal, but, you know. <laughs> you just do it all. But, and, you know, and I started puking and getting high and puking and getting high. And then I, I remember waking up one morning. I had a lot of shit to do that day, and I was like, I had the flu. I'm like, fuck. It was withdrawal. the flu. And then, yeah, after about 30 seconds, I was like, oh, wait a sec. I know what this is. And my first thought again was, wow, cool, me and Keith. It's like now we're bonded. Mm -hmm. Like so fucked up. It's that um, troubled artist kind of Towns Van Zandt. I was talking to someone the other day about alcohol even. It's like you they want to be, you know, destroyed almost because then they can relate to like Johnny Cash or again Towns Van Zandt or, you know, is that kind of what you felt like? I have my own theory about that, by the way. Um, yeah, except I wasn't an artist. Yeah, I was a hanger on. I was a I was a second line in the concentric circle. Yeah. You know, I wanted I I wanted to be an artist. I wanted to be as close as I could get. But there's always that angst. You know, um, Keith and Mick talk about it. They, Keith has this great quote. He says, uh, "A touch of glimmer is more addicting than smack." Wow. And he's talked about how people want to get next to that white hot center, and some people can't handle it, and they die. There's been a lot of deaths around the stones. Um, but because of that quote, that's where Mick and Keith got their producing name. Whenever they produce, they, they do it under the name of the Glimmer Twins. It's from that quote. Wow, A I touch of glimmer is more addicting than smack. Um, but my own personal belief is that artists have a gift. Um, and that gift comes from, you know, insert your favorite name for higher power here. Uh, and I think... As recipients of the gift, first of all, I think the word gift is an interesting word um, because a gift is not something that's earned or deserved. All right? If it's earned or deserved, we call it a wage. Um, if we didn't do anything to deserve it, it's a gift. <laughs> and we get this gift, and as artists, we're supposed to serve the gift. And the way that we do that is we're supposed to experience life and relationships and feelings and emotions and then translate them through our given medium whether that's sculpture, painting, music, whatever. Um, and in so doing, we carry a message to people because it allows them to relate to the feelings being shared. And I think the recipients of those gifts um, have certain physical attributes that are required, and one of which is, I've seen this consistently since I was a little kid, is that artists tend to feel more. You know, something that a normal person would feel on a level of two or three, an artist can feel on a level of eight or nine. Very sensitive people. They're just more empathic to that stuff, especially if they've served the gift and they've honed it. They become more and more sensitive, right? So that they experience everything. And if you look through time, through hundreds of years, it's just sometimes, it just, it gets so overwhelming that I think you just wanna turn the volume down. I just need a break. And alcohol and drugs are really good at turning the volume down. Yep. And if you look through history, you know, whether it's Edgar Allan Poe or Dorothy Parker or this one or that one or whomever or Jeff Jampol, 
although I certainly wasn't the artist they were. Um, you know, I think that artists tend to be to float around that um, that invisible line. There's an invisible line, I think, between genius and insanity. And I think to get really close to it, sometimes you got to step over it. And I think that if you're experiencing stuff, if you're experiencing things on a level of eight or nine that everybody else is feeling on a level three, you just want to turn it down and just get me to three. And alcohol and drugs are really good for that. Yeah. Until you wake up and the mask doesn't work anymore and then... Yeah. Well, for those of us who have the disease of addiction, you know, once that starts... Um, although I talked to a, 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 a good friend who is actually a DNA researcher and he runs a lab at Cornell. And he, he, he said, look, I, this is way oversimplified. He said, but look at it this way. He said, every human being is one of four types. He said, type one, um, you are born without any markers for addiction. You will not be an addict. Doesn't matter how much drugs you use, how much you drink, you're not going to be an addict. And then type two, you are born with the markers for addiction, but they're recessive. Same thing. You could do as much drugs as you want, alcohol. You could, you know, and it's, you're never going to be an addict. Hmm. Type three, you are born with the markers for addiction, and they are um, dominant you will be an addict. It doesn't matter how much you try and avoid it and how little you do, you will be an addict. And then type four, you are born with the markers recessive, but some event or trauma kicks them into dominance. You will be an addict. So again, you have that disease of addiction usually long before we experience the first drug or the first drink. It's there and it's growing and it's progressive and it's incurable and it's fatal and one of the I've never seen anything that treats addiction as beautifully as drugs and alcohol. It just tamps it down, right? And I and I think a lot of artists who may not be addicts but have just want to tamp down the volume get the same effect. Just Jample's personal theory. I have nothing to back that up. I totally agree with you. Um, yeah, and I mean, and then when you get sober, you have to learn how to live life without being able to turn it down, being able to adjust. Oh, my God. Yes, yeah. yeah, it is literally a rebirth. I mean, and I remember the two most difficult things I experienced were um, sober sex, but even harder than that, sober dancing. Frightening. Sober dancing. Terrifying, isn't it? Especially being six foot eight and not a blender. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've had friends, uh, I was talking to somebody the other day in Austin, cocaine addict, and said that uh, the scariest thing was having sex with his girlfriend of 10 years because he had never had sober sex with her. Oh, my God, you're right there, present, smelling, tasting, seeing, hearing, everything. Yep. (laughs) So heroin starts at the Sausalito record plant. How long did it take you to get fully addicted? You're doing it once a week, two? Oh, no, I was doing You have to do it pretty much every day for about a week. Did that start right did. off the bat? Okay. Oh, yeah. So within the month of June, maybe if you started, you were full-blown. Yeah. Well, you know, and then the tolerance just expands so quickly, and, and certainly not on a linear scale. That's more logarithmic. Um, and that's How are you I'm, financing it? Well, that's a really good question. Um, at the time, I was hustling and I was selling audio, um, I was a great audio salesman, so I made good money. And then I was doing some work for the labels, and I had kind of transitioned from being a, a stereo salesman to a promotion guy, junior promotion guy. Um, and then it got harder and harder, right? But I managed. I always had a hustle. In fact, I've talked to so many people who have gotten sober, and I share that same feeling, and I've heard them say, I said, like, you know, what was the magic thing? And they, they said, dude, I just ran out of hustle. I just, I ran out of hustle, wow. you know, cause it gets so hard. And I try and tell newcomers today, it's like, listen, sobriety actually is the softer, easier way. Like this is way softer, you know? And I said, look at all the guys who are successful, who are sober, right? Like guys like me or others. I said, let me tell you something. If being loaded was better, I'd do it, I'd do it. I have enough resources now where I could probably stay loaded for the rest of my life, which would be shortened, but, um, and I don't. That should be an indicator for you. Like, if it really was better, I'd be doing it. This is way better. And it's, it's easier to do. Um, but what happened was, I, as I got myself deeper and deeper in, I just realized clearly San Francisco was the problem, not me. Um, 
and I had produced a song for Eye Protection that um, had come to the attention of this new DJ at this new station, K-Rock, this guy Jed the Fish, and I got this call one day, and we had this song that went on a, uh, a compilation, a um, San Francisco compilation. Somehow, Jed the Fish found this song and started banging it at K-Rock. Wow. And I got this call. It's like, dude, you have a hit in Los Angeles. And I'm like, <laughs> what are you talking about? I was like, wow. And so all of a sudden, my delusions of grandeur and being this big mogul producer, and I was like, okay, this is it. And I thought, I'm going to move to L.A. I can get a job selling stereos. And I'm going to put together some money and I'll find some investors and I'll start a production company. And so off I went scampering to Los Angeles. Did you receive uh, some funds from the song doing well? Any royalties, anything? I don't or was think that... so. Okay. But that so. gave you a buzz to get down here because you, the song had hit. That's why you moved out. Yeah, now, but there was some intrinsic um, arrangements that were difficult. Because here's the thing, right? When you're a heroin addict, it's 24-7, 365. Like if you're doing blow and you go through a bunch of blow and you're having a wild evening and it's like 1 a.m. and you can't get any more blow and you're desperate and you're trying to everywhere and calling people and waking them up and pissing off your friends, but nobody's got any, you just go to bed. Like you try and take a Valium or drink, swallow a few drinks and you just go to bed and you're fine. Same is not the case for heroin. Once you start to go into heroin withdrawal, you have to get heroin. There's no ifs, ands, or buts, right? And, you know, it's just going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. And one of the horrors for, of, of heroin withdrawal is that you're laying there literally feeling like you're coming apart from the inside, just puking and your nose is running and you've got diarrhea and you, these contractions, which is where the word kicking came from. And you're just like, maybe I can tough this out. And you like, you tough it out for three or four hours and you're in misery, and you look up at the clock, and it's been three minutes. And you thought it was three or four hours. And it's just like, okay, I'm going to go through this for weeks. Were you trying to kick? Sorry to cut you off, but or were you, you just couldn't find any? Well, you're always trying to kick. You're always thinking. So you wanted to quit. You but, didn't, but the so. idea, to finish my thought, is that you're going through this horror, and just one $20 hit will make it all perfect. I can't do Okay, just give me some. I'll do this tomorrow. Right now, I can't take it. I can't take it. I can't take it. And you just do that every day. Yep. And so the big um, logistics issue of moving to Los Angeles is how am I going to get my heroin? Because, you know, you can talk to a friend. You can go, hey, dude, where can I get some pot? Or, you know, you know anybody has got blow? But you can't really go up to some, a stranger at a party and go, hey, anybody get any heroin? It's, it's like not a socially acceptable question. Yeah. So I couldn't source anything here. But one of the other bands I was managing, um, The Symptoms in San Francisco, the girlfriend of the lead singer was one of my heroin dealers. And she worked in an art gallery in the city. And it's funny, I hadn't seen her in probably 35 years. And I ran into her in the recovery community. And now she's like got a couple decades clean and sober and she's working as a drug counselor down in the South Bay and we ended up getting together. It was amazing. Uh -huh. But she was my drug dealer. And the post office had just started this new service called Express Mail. It was this brand new concept where you could mail something and they guaranteed delivery then by the next day at 3 p.m. I'm like, wow, that is groundbreaking, right? Um, it was like 20 bucks, but guaranteed next day by 3 p.m. So I said to Judy, I'm like, okay, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to go wire you money at Western Union. You'll make up a little tchotchke or something and you'll hide the... China White in there, and then you send it to me, your express mail with a bogus return address, and I'll get it the next day. Okay. And that's how I would get my heroin. And by the way, that claim about 3 p.m. was total bullshit. I mean, it was rarely there by, by 3 p.m. And at countless times, and when I say countless, hundreds of times, I'd be dying in full-blown heroin withdrawal, 3, 3.30, 4 p.m., I'd have to go into my get, get to my car, you know, puking every minute, my nose running, and drive around the neighborhood and find the express mail truck, which I would, <laughs> and get my heroin. Um, Where was your first place in Hollywood or in L.A.? Where did you first, first place? Live? Was at thirteen forty five North Hayworth. Hayworth, where is that? How, Hayworth uh, is between Sunset and Fountain, and it's just east of Crescent Heights. 
Okay, so yeah, kind of behind um, the old House of Blues there, or it would have been. Well, east of there. Yeah. East of there, east of Crescent Heights. Okay. Kind of near where the um, the movie theaters are on the corner of Sunset and Crescent Heights. Gotcha. Near Greenblatt's Deli, just yep. south of there. Which we ate at Greenblatt's last time you were here, a great place. Yeah. What were you working on then when you got here? So you get the, you're managing bands, you arrive in L.A., you're getting heroin delivered to you through the <sighs> the mail system. What were you working on? Yeah, by the way, you want to know why I remember that address so well? Why is that? Because one day I had saved up enough money to get two whole grams of China White at once. And China White was 1200 bucks a gram. Oh, this was a big expenditure. $2,400 in 1980s money yeah. for a, a ne'er-do-well street hustler. It was not easy. But I finally scraped it together. And, and so I said to Judy, okay, boom, I'm wiring you $2,400. Get this one right. She says, okay. She got the money. And then the next day, I just sent it out. Yep. It's all good. I'm like, great. Of course, 3 o'clock, no truck. 3.30, 4. I'm in full-blown withdrawal now. I don't have a penny to my name. I have nothing I can pawn. I am screwed. So I go out. I find the truck finally. And he's like, I don't have anything on the truck for you. Ugh. I'm like, what? <laughs> that had never happened before. He's like, Sorry. And we'll try again tomorrow. I'm like, tomorrow? No, 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 no. There is no tomorrow. Uh, it's funny because one of the songs Andy Preboy wrote for Concrete Bone was Tomorrow, Wendy. Uh, <laughs> That's what I felt. This? Tomorrow, Wendy. No. Oh, no, wow, it's just okay. I was thinking about that just now. Um, I ran home. I start calling Judy. This is pre-cell phone, pre-pager. Nothing. I'm getting an answering machine. It's like 4.30, 4.35. Oh, I call the post office and I go, okay, listen, what happens... If somebody sends something to me and there's a wrong address, they said, well, if, they, if the address is a valid address, we hold it overnight and we'll try and deliver it the next day. If it's not a valid address, um, we'll return it to sender. I'm like, those are not, neither of those are good options. <laughs> Finally, I get Judy at like 10 to 5. I'm like, Judy, I'm freaking out. She goes, I sent it. I said, do you have the receipt? She goes, yeah, I think so. Go, go get it. I'm telling you, Jeff, I sent it. It's the same as always. Go get the receipt. Okay, hold on. Comes back. She goes, I got it. Where'd you send it? She goes, Jeff Jampol, 1345 North Hollywood. No! It's Hayworth. Oh, shit. You sent it to Hollywood. Oh, my God. She sent it to 1345 North Hollywood Avenue. Oh, my God. I'm like, I'm in, like... I don't know whether I'm crying or puking, but I'm freaked out. Luckily, luckily, 1345 North Hollywood Avenue does not exist. Call the post office back. And they go, no, that's not a valid address. We'll return it. I said, How, how's that done? Because I knew she had a fake return address. So they said, it goes, the, the drivers come back, and by 9.30 or 10 p.m., we send it all to Terminal Annex near LA Airport, and then it gets, flies out that night. Okay, thank you. All right, I'm driving to Terminal Annex. Oh, my gosh. I get in my car, you know, mucus flying and puking every, I don't know, mile or two. I get down to the airport, and Terminal Annex is fucking huge. It's hundreds of thousands of square feet with this little tiny office in front. And I'm, I go in there, and again, street hustle. I found my package. Found my package. I'm like, I got to shoot up instantly. I stopped at some shell station on Century Boulevard. Went in the bathroom, sink not working, so of course, toilet water. And there's little Jeff Jampel from the valley, you know, on my knees, puking, um, pulling up toilet water into a syringe to get well. Oh, my gosh. The insanity of it. The insanity. Just... But I digress. What year is this, roughly, when that happened? <sighs> Let's say this has got to be like 83. Okay. How long did the heroin, that two grams, last you? That two grams would probably last me five or six days, maybe maybe a week. Whoa. Damn. In the end, I was shooting two grams a day. So you're spending thousands and thousands of dollars every week. Well, no, I stopped doing China White. I was doing, I was spending 560 bucks a day at the end. I remember that. <sighs> How much uh, chaos did all this create? I mean, when did you end up in the hospital with your, your leg almost getting amputated? What year was this? That was in uh, February 89. So I was stringing along my habit all the way. Um, and what had happened was I was working at Federated on La Brea. 
I don't know what that is. It was a stereo store. Back when stereo stores were ubiquitous, they uh -huh. were everywhere. And Freighter Federated was one of the big ones. They probably had 20 stores in LA. But their, their big Hollywood store was on La Brea, just north of uh, Melrose. Um, it's where Aaron Brothers Art is now. Oh, yeah. Okay. You're and, selling stereo equipment then? Yeah. The managing's done. All the, you're just trying well, to make I'm, a I paycheck. I still want to raise money to, to start a production company, which I ended up doing. Um, I got my brother and my father and one of my father's friends to put in some money. Um, but there was this guy who used to come in and federated this really weird abstract guy with a, this white guy with a soul patch. And he would be in there almost every day. And none of the salesmen would talk to him. I'm like, nobody's helping this guy. And they're like, he's never going to buy anything. He's wasted all of our time. I'm like, I'll talk to him. And I started talking to him. And the guy was really cool. And again, I speak abstract very well. And we hit it off. And we started going to dinner. And um, we would do some lines and have drinks and talk. And turns out he was the jazz critic for the LA Herald Examiner. Wow. And he was telling me, he said, you know, my buddy and I, we grew up in Detroit my best friend, and we have this little indie band that our other friend, Michael Zilka, signed to his label in New York called Z Records. He said, but nobody will hire us as producers. No, well, that's what we really want to do. We want to produce, but nobody will give us a shot. I'm like, I will. He's like, what do you mean? I go, I'll sign you to a production deal. I'm getting some money some, from some investors. And his band was called Was Not Was. And he was David Was, and his partner was Don Was. Wow. And so nobody would give these guys a shot. So I signed them to production deals. Um, I moved Andy Preboy to L.A. Time out. Don Waz, you signed a production deal? Correct. That's awesome. Carry on, sorry. Yeah, that's when I knew, that's when I first met Don and we became friends. And by the way, he looked exactly like the cover of Bookends. He looked like Art Garfunkel with this Jufro and cable knit sweater with the turtleneck, totally straight edge. And I was like the fat, boozing, carousing, bringing blow and girls in the studio. And he was giving me stink eye like, we got a job to do here. Really? And yeah, now he's become Don Was. Yeah, he was in here with Slash recently. <laughs> I love Don. And again, we've been friends that whole time, probably almost 40 years. Um, and David. Those guys gave me a good education. And uh, that's how I started producing with Don. Um, they had some deal with another childhood friend where they had done some crazy contract with him. And they got his studio from midnight to noon every day out in Birmingham, Michigan. And so... Don would fly out and he would use all the players, all the musicians from Parliament Funkadelic, and he would record these long 12-inch um, dance singles, and he would and bring back the 2-inch. And Don and I would go into Paramount Studios, and we'd mix all night long, and we'd come out at like 8 in the morning. And he, I would remember he said, okay, we're going to go have a rock and roll breakfast. I said, what's that? He goes, we're going to walk across the street to Pink's and have a, a chili dog and a mitzvah cola <laughs> at 8.30 a.m. after being up all night. Um, but yeah, that's how I got started. Incredible. Do you remember, uh, have you ever read Scar Tissue, Ketis' book, Anthony Ketis? You know what? I haven't. I have it. I haven't. Phenomenal. It's one of the very few I haven't read yet. Phenomenal book. Came out probably 10 years ago now, but you know, obviously his heroin addiction, he's the stories. But did you ever see him around uh, in those you know, 80s of your addiction and running around LA and punk music and funk? and? No, because you got to remember, I was, I was nobody. I was nothing. I was... I. Those guys, I mean, that was real music business. That, I aspired to that. But they were playing around L.A. and stuff. Yeah. I thought you might have saw them or They something. were real bands. They were real players playing real concerts at real venues, the real audiences. That was not me. Yeah. I, was a, I was a bitch wannabe. Yeah, I thought you might have just ran into Ketis maybe under the bridge. No, uh, it's, a, it's a valid thought, but, but no, <laughs> I hadn't. When did uh, sobriety come in? I mean, were you trying numerous different times? Did you ever any uh, attain any um, significant amount of time, like 30 days, 90 days? No, no. What happened was um, I decided that I was going to detox some heroin by, uh, with using codeine. And I, had, I knew this uh, music industry lawyer who had a pharmaceutical, a pharmacy client, and he would get me these uh, bottles of 1,000 number four codeines, 2,000 bucks a bottle. And, I, and I, I weaned myself off of heroin using codeine, but then I became a raving codeine addict. And I remember I was taking 18 number fours three times a day. I didn't find out till later I was taking a fatal dose of Tylenol three times a day. Jesus. And a doctor said, he goes, the fact that you were so fat probably saved your life. Um, but yeah, it screwed up my liver. Were 
you were overweight during heroin addiction through all the oh, time yeah. just because you'd eat horribly and yeah yeah hogan os pizza and heroin man wow. they go together yeah but anyway so i detoxed uh off of heroin getting on a codeine then became a raving codeine addict then i tried to then i decided i was going to detox off of codeine using methadone um i'd still never shot up i was just snorting heroin um and they wouldn't let me on the methadone program unless i had track marks so then i had to go find a friend <laughs> to shoot me up to Jeez. get track marks to get on methadone which then got me off of codeine but then i'm a raving methadone addict and they have the clinics around here that you can go oh yeah i went to the one on whitworth and la cienega um and then the methadone wasn't holding me and so i became a methadone and heroin addict and then pretty soon methadone heroin and codeine um and then i started shooting up at, at that point it just becomes an economic decision yeah you're not even getting high you're just staying out of withdrawal um and i was real fat and i would have to like plunge a needle into my extremities 10 15 times just to find a vein so i'm shooting up four times a day so that's 50 60 attempts and every time you came out of the methadone clinic not every time but many times cops would be waiting out there and they'd check your arms because lo and behold i mean methadone clinics are excellent places to find burglars oh wow who are breaking into houses to steal stereo equipment and cameras to finance their habit who knew um and they would always check your arms and so i thought okay well i'm going to kill two birds with one stone I'm going to start shooting up in my legs and I'll fool them. Ha 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 ha, which I did. Um, and I started missing the veins in my, in my legs. And, and so what happens is you go in a vein and you shoot in the drugs and then um, you miss the vein. And then those drugs just are sitting there in your muscle tissue and they mm -hmm. rot their way up to the surface. And that's what an abscess is. And so I started getting dozens and dozens and hundreds of abscesses. And eventually hundreds of them all joined together on my left front shin and started opening this big cave in my leg oh my god and i had it i was taking antibiotics 24 7 like for almost two years i always had a fever of 101 102 degrees that was just life because my leg was constantly infected and weeping and i would have to wrap a towel around it and change it halfway through the day because it was soaked and did you go to the doctor though at some point throughout i got this? went to the doctor to get antibiotics and they just said you got to quit this but here's yeah at least the antibiotics hopefully yeah. fight the infection of course and doctors really don't know that much about addiction it's like even with today with the guys i counsel i won't use doctors or psychiatrists unless they're also in recovery those guys know everything yeah um and then unbeknownst to me my tibia bone started poking through the tissue how could you walk even to work or i mean well it hurt around. but again lo and behold opiates are a great painkiller <laughs> so yeah you're just scraping um, by but it still hurt even through all that even through the haze of heroin and methadone and codeine it, it's hurt a lot and i had a limp and uh, i would wear these jogging suits because they would get soaked even with the towel around my leg and with the fever and i kept this loaded gun by my bed it was like the only possession i had left um, just so I could kill myself when shit got too bad. And you knew that I, was a, an escape route. Yeah, I mean, you know, if I got fired from my gig or Javier cut me off or I couldn't get access to heroin, I knew it was only going to get as bad as I was willing to let it get. And I knew I was going to die. You kind of accept that. You know, it could be blue skies and 80 degrees like it is today with birds singing in the trees, but it's just gray. Just did, gray. Did you have some friends and people around you that were using as well? Did you have like a group or you were a solo drug user? Uh, well, you, what happens is you end up bifurcating your life, right? There's this really amazing song for me personally. It's in my top 25 of all time. And it's on that Jim Carroll Catholic Boy album. And it's called um, City Drops Into the Night. And he, boy, he gets it so right, right. And he talks about there's these two worlds in New York. All right, there's this daytime world that you all see. And then when the city drops into the night, the underworld comes up. Wow. Right? And it's a whole different existence. And so my daytime friends and my daytime coworkers and family knew something was wrong. They just thought I was an asshole. Or, you know, my boss used to say to me, You want why do you want another advance? You're just gonna sniff it up your nose. And I would say, ha ha ha. Give me the advance. Um and then my under, my heroin dealer and doer friends were a completely separate life. And so you live this duality and ne'er the twain <laughs> shall meet. Um, and so, yeah, the guys from my night world were just the worst. And I, along with me, 
you know, they were no worse or better than me. But I saw the most feral, desperate forms of humanity and lived it. And it just becomes a reality. And so you have to be schizophrenic in a way. I have to be able to talk to guys like you during the day, and I have to be able to talk to guys like them during the night. Um, and, and it's this crazy duality. Yeah. Well, and everybody, you know, the manipul manipulative mastermind that you're also an addict tend to have with the disease, right? You're just constantly manipulating situations, yourself, your boss, your people. Yeah. You know, um, it's funny. I speak up at prison every few months, and there's really? this one prison that has a separate wing where they do a drug recovery program. It's on, they have their own pod and their own counselors. And I said, you know, think about this. It's like we could walk into a bar in a strange town like Toledo that we'd never been in, and in, with no money, and in 20 minutes we'd have dope. And they're all like nod, like, yeah, duh. Like, yeah, think about that. We can do something at like 2 a.m., totally fucked up, that the titans of corporate America can't do with billions of dollars and all the resources behind them at high noon. And if you can marshal like 5% of that, you will rule the planet. All right? Do you think heroin's more uh, prevalent now than um, back then? I know kids in... When I went to high school, if you smoked weed, that was very edgy. And right. that was, you know, 2000, 2001, too. But now the kids in high school are all doing heroin, having Norcos and Vicodins. And, you know, do you think... I, I don't know specifically, but I can tell you generally what I've seen in society is a, a constant breaking down of boundaries. Because that same dynamic you just spoke of, I mean, if when I went to school as a kid and somebody hit another kid... Oh my God, that was the talk of the town. Yeah. Now it's like a kid brings a gun to school in his backpack but doesn't fire it. It's like no big deal. So I think what's happened is we become desensitized. You know, I just saw That's some perfect. statistic last week when there was another mass shooting and they said there have been a mass shooting is defined with uh, four or more getting injured. There's been 232 so far this year. Yep. That's I that hit home just what you said so much because I was just in Austin, Texas. Right. Obviously, some guy just unleashes in this kind of main area in Austin, but no one was even talking about it. You know, on social media, you know, it's like if that would have happened five years ago, it would have been everybody like the Orlando shooting. You know, that was obviously bigger, but that was everything then. Right, so it's exactly what you just said, and it also applies to the music industry. I think where it's kind of you're constantly breaking down boundaries that you're constantly trying to shock people and be vile. And that's even what the record labels do with pop culture. The macro has always been in pop culture of breaking through the clutter. And clutter always changes, right? But now, you know, with the advent of social media and the advent of everybody being connected all over the world all the time, it's harder to harder to A, build up any kind of constituency. Um, but it gets much harder. You know, the word, the phrase mass media had meaning you know when we were growing up not that it was better or worse just how it was you had three television networks an independent if you were in a large metropolis you had a couple am radio stations maybe an fm if you were in a cutting edge metropolis and movie theaters and cream magazine and that was it that was it and so you could actually break through and you could actually achieve this kind of mass media state of existence Right. And now it's all fractured. And there's, you know, it's, I mean, Bruce Springsteen wrote about 57 channels and nothing on with the advent of cable television. Now it's like 4,000 channels and something's on every minute. Mm -hmm. So you don't have those mass gatherings anymore. You, what you have is all these little tiny pockets. And I think the next billionaires, amongst the next billionaires, will be really effective filters. Um, we just had the worldwide head of music for Spotify in my class a few weeks ago. And he said, uh, you know, he said, we're uploading 60,000 new songs every day. 60,000 new songs every day. That's just Monday. And then it's Tuesday. Like, how could you possibly listen to that many songs? You can't. You have to have an effective filter. You know, in the 60s and 70s, Rolling Stone magazine was an effective filter. If they spoke about a band, you wanted to check them out. DJs were very effective filters because they were playing what they wanted before the advent of playlisting. And when there was playlisting, program directors were filters. And yeah. Radio stations were filters. And your friends and T-shirts that you saw on Friends. Oh, what's, what's Leonard Skinner? Um, 
And now it's just there's way too much info. And so I think people are doing, having to do more and more to break through the clutter, sometimes with shock value, sometimes with sexuality, sometimes with violence, um, you know, anything to break through the clutter. Uh, I'm not saying that that's valid or it's something I would do, but that's what I think a lot of people are doing. Um, or maybe it's just the stuff that breaks through is the stuff that you become cognizant of is the more sexual or violent, right? Yeah. Um, but it's always been about cutting through the clutter. It's always been rising to the top. You know, I, I want to argue with you about something else that you said once. And it was to me and studio <laughs> owner Paul Camerata, which was about Pat Boone and Jim Morrison. Right. Do you remember? I do. Okay. Can you say that again? What I said was, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the full version so that yeah. whoever's watching this will get the full flavor, which is I said that su all successful artists, really successful artists, have some form of magic. Right? There's some alchemy there. There is something that connected a 12-year-old to Jim Morrison, to Janis Joplin, to Led Zeppelin, to whomever. And I tell my students in the first week of class, and I said, and if you think it's about the music, you're going to fail my class. Because if you think it's about the music, then by deductive logic and reasoning, you also think the magic to James Dean is about his acting. And you think the magic to Marilyn Monroe is that she's hot, beautiful, and blonde. Now, all those things are true, and music is a really excellent entry point, but it's not the thing. And I have two ways to prove that to you, or two ways to illustrate. Number one, Pat Boone had a lot more gold records and hit singles than Jim Morrison ever did. So if it's about the music, why are 12-year-olds not discovering Pat Boone? And the second thing that I use to measure that is go to any festival, now that they're happening again, Find that 19-year-old kid in a Clash t-shirt and ask him to name his three favorite songs, <laughs> right? Or one of our peers who's sitting in that, you know, really hipster bar in Silver Lake wearing the bitchin' aqua blue green Coltrane shirt, ask him what his favorite Coltrane composition is. You already know he doesn't know the answer because it's not about the music. The yeah. music is the entry point, yeah. right? And I used to tell artists when I was doing new artist development, which used to be my thing, I was like, dude, I, I can't manage songs. I, I manage artists. I manage artists. So have a fucking point of view. Stand for something. Tell me what you are about. Right? If I have to tell you, then I'm the artist. Um, but you should have some kind of identity. You know, the word brand is interesting. People overuse it a lot. Oh, I'm branding myself. Or, oh, I'm going to rebrand. And they, they throw this word around. And it actually has a definition. A brand is a set of identifiers or things that tell you what something is about. Every human being has their own brand, right? Every product has their own brand. Um, like Coca-Cola, their brand is they are America. You know, it's classic, tried and true, American drink since the 1800s, red can, same thing, right? Pepsi, choice of a new generation. Pepsi is all about you know, surfing and skating and BMX and Coca-Cola is about walking through the park with your honey, you know, on, on July 4th. <laughs> um, they're both really just carbonated brown sugar water. But people buy into that brand, right? Every human being has a brand. What shirt you're wearing, what watch you're wearing, what car you step out of, what the things you say, the way you style your hair, the people you're hanging out with, give a clue to an outside observer of who and what you might be about. Yes. Obviously, it's only a very surface thing, right? But if you see a guy walking down the street with a leather collar and a leather bracelet with spikes on it, you know, and he's got some goth tattoo, it gives you an indicator of what this guy's about versus some other guy who's got a pocket protector and broken glasses and, you know, a buttoned-up sports shirt tucked in. Um, and so we all have different identifiers. We all have different facets that, that contribute to our brand that let outsiders kind of know what, we're about gives them an introduction to us before they meet us or get to know us. That's like Frank Zappa, <coughs> Frank Zappa said as well. M music has become the wallpaper of our lives, and that's why it's no more uh, obvious than with like Radiohead fans too. They need you to know that they listen to Radiohead. You know, would you yeah, like vegans? Yeah. Exactly. Somebody said, "How you cook? Can you tell someone's vegan?" I said, "Don't worry, they'll so, fucking tell you." In the first five seconds. 
Yeah, yeah. Things today are more overt, right? There was actually, there's this Freudian model that I follow. I don't want to get too pedantic here. But Freud talked about his theory was that human beings are the only animals that are born without instinct. And as a replacement for instinct, we have the ability to reason and, and our intellect not to mention that great opposable thumb, but um, he said we, the human being goes through three phases of life, right? We go through an infantile ego, an adolescent ego state, and an adult ego state. And they're designed to do three different things, right? So the infantile ego state, we come out of the womb, and it's completely self-centered. It's focused on self, and it allows a baby to cry out when he's in danger or hungry or cold to attract the attention of his mother or father to help ensure his survival. So the, in, the um, infantile ego state is all about survival. And around age 11, 12, 13, we naturally morph into an adolescent ego state. And that's the first time that as a human we see beyond the end of our own nose. We come out of this self-centered phase and we start to like, kind of like a gopher popping his head up through the dirt and we start to look around and go, who am I? Right? It's what Essie Hinton wrote about when she wrote The Outsiders. It was a bunch of 13-year-olds trying to figure out, am I a soch? Am I a greaser? Am I a jock? Um, and, I, and then around age 17, 18, 19, we morph into an adult ego state, which allows us to give and nurture life. So those are the three phases, survival, socialization, passing on life. But that socialization phase lasts from age, say, 13 to 18, it corresponds with middle school and high school. And what happens is we come into middle school as a blank slate. And by the time we finish high school, we'll have completely branded ourselves. We'll figure out, am I a surfer? Am I a jock? Am I a nerd? Am I a stoner? And by the way, we, every artistic and aesthetic decision we will make for the rest of our lives is based on that foundation we will establish during those years. Wow, that's amazing. And that's... as a company, that's where I focus a lot of our, our energies and our resources is getting right to those people when they're coming out as a blank canvas. And when they're trying to figure out who they are, here, here's Jim Morrison. Here's Janis Joplin. Here's Bird. Check it out. You might like it. Because if I get them, I got them for life. That's extremely accurate and very profound to hear. You get clean as a result of your leg being infected, they wanted to amputate your leg. Well, they took me in to amputate it. They took you in to amputate it. Um, you're going through heroin withdrawals, and you do seven days to get you off, a detox, before they want to amputate it, correct? They take me in to amputate. They find my family. And they said, this guy's completely mentally incompetent, um, but his tibia bone is exposed, and he's got cellulitis, and we have to amputate his leg. Otherwise, he's going to die. He might still die, but he will definitely die if we don't amputate, and he's not qualified to make that decision, so you have to make a decision for him, which they say, okay. I'm telling you this all secondhand. I wasn't really there. Yeah. Um, so they took me into surgery, and then I guess the anesthesiologist said no. He called the surgery. He said, no, 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 no. His tolerance level to opiates is way too high. I can't put him out. You've got to go detox him for seven to ten days, and then we'll, do, we'll amputate. So they trundled me off to detox um la county hospital no this is actually beverly hills medical center which doesn't exist anymore which is in the slums of beverly hills yeah beverly hills nonetheless but uh yeah they had a chemical dependency unit in that hospital and so i ended up there going through horrible detox I, because remember i'm detoxing off codeine and methadone and heroin and whatever else um and they're also debriding my leg every day which is basically scrubbing it with scrub brushes and betadine to try and stimulate growth, which, and of course they can't give me an anesthetic because I'm in detox, so that was a hell of a punishment. Um, and then after about eight, nine days, back in a surgery, and because of all that scrubbing, they noticed some tissue growth. And so they said, okay, well, let's try reconstructive surgery instead of amputating, and wow. that's what they did. And Incredible. then back in a detox, and then back in a surgery for a skin graft, um, and then back in a detox, and then back in for a second skin graft, and then detox, and then sober, and then relapsing after 90 days, shooting up right in that same leg again, um, with every IQ point I now possess. I Were remember, you in the program? Sorry to cut you off. Were you in the program, though, in that 90 days, or did you just say, okay, yeah. I, I yeah, detoxed yeah. now? Okay, so yeah. you were going to meetings. Yeah. You thought you had a little bit of hold on, and 90 days goes, 
back to shooting up. How long did you go back out for then? Uh, I was, I would go out and come back. I would go out and come back uh, until, <laughs> until the Rolling Stones were coming to town. And I used to go to this men's meeting on Sunday in Culver City. And I remember walking in and these first two rows of these guys, they were so jocular and laughing and buddies. And I felt like such an outsider and I wanted to be a part of, and I felt like this big fat newcomer, loser, no self-esteem. And, and, uh, and then one of them came up to me one day and they said, hey, you, you work in the music business, right? I said, yeah. And he said, oh, the Stones are coming to town. And you got to understand also, Keith Richards is the patron saint of heroin addicts everywhere. Um, and all dope fiends love the Stones as far as I could tell. I said, yeah. He says, well, can you get tickets? I'm like, yeah, probably. He goes, can you get me 12 of them? <laughs> it's like, all right, let me make a call. And their tickets were like $36 each. I said, okay, uh, they're not on sale yet, but give me the $36. And then when they go on sale, I'll get them for you. So he gives me the money. The next day I must've gotten 15, 20 phone calls. Dude, all these guys from the meeting. We heard you get Stones tickets. Can you get me a pair? Like, yes, I can. Hey, Jeff, I, I heard you're getting Stones tickets. Can I get four tickets? Absolutely. So $2,889 later. Um, I don't know. I'm waiting for the tickets to go on sale. And now I'm in, right? Now I'm like, Jeff, they come into the meeting. And, you know, I'm still a people pleaser. I still think I have to buy my way into acceptance, which was absolutely false. But those are one of, one of the many false pretenses under which I was operating. And so I'm really enjoying this. And then I relapse. With the money. Well, no. First, I burn <laughs> through all my money. and But I don't tell anybody I've relapsed. Because now I'm in, right? I don't want to be a loser. So... I'm going to meetings and I'm sharing and I'm taking little chips loaded and I'm like kind of nodding out, but not really. And I burn through all of my money and then I burn through all of their money. Oh. And now I've got this oil burner habit going. And then I, this is where I start to realize that all those stupid, hoary cliches that I had heard in recovery were actually true. I thought they were scare tactics. Um, I thought they were all scare tactics and I thought it was uh, just this line of shit they were giving newcomers. It's okay. We weren't talking. <laughs> Jesus. This is where I started to learn that all these hoary, stupid cliches that I'd heard around the rooms were actually true. I thought they were scare tactics. They certainly sounded like um, bullshit to me. Mm -hmm. But once I'm in the grips of this, you know, they told me you start off, you, you take back up where you left off, and then it goes beyond, and then this, and then this. And then I watched it all start happening. I'm like, oh, shit, they were right. But too late, right? Um, so now I've burned through all the money. And the guys are starting to like, hey, where's our tickets? Like, concert's like a month away. Dude, where's our tickets? And this is where that spiritual principle of one day at a time comes in, right? So as long as I can get them off my back that day, I'm good. And I had to start making up excuses a lot. There's Because I had... I, I, uh, I had gotten, taken all these guys' money, right? And so my solution, my brilliant solution, was I went to Office Supplies Unlimited on Pico Boulevard, and I bought this big book of blank vouchers. And then I bought a red uh, rubber stamp that said, paid. And I went to my brother's law office, and I asked to borrow his tie. He had a typewriter. And so uh, I filled out 18 vouchers and just made them look really good, you know, like, a six six asterisk 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 nine you know point 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 four seven Rolling Stones Guns and Roses L A Coliseum section one hundred four seats one two three four paid wow and I brought those to that Sunday meeting I said here you go guys finally seventeen guys here's your vouchers and then my sponsor Joey I said Joey because I know how much you love the Stones here's a free pair of tickets for you because I'm a good guy. <laughs> They're all like, great. I said, just take this voucher, show up at Will Call at the Coliseum, and they'll give you your tickets. Problem solved for today. Yep. I didn't really think forward, right? And I shortly thereafter, I ended up um, in the hospital again, detoxing. And the guy who ran that chemical dependency unit, John Bocanegra, and John was just standing there in the, in the doorway, kind of, I remember him with his arms folded, looking at me, just shaking his head. 
and smiling. I'm like, what? He's like, haven't you had enough? I'm like, yeah, John, I've had enough. And I'm, I'm here in these cute blue pajamas and detox. I get it. He's like, you need to go to impact. Now, I had heard this word impact since the very first time I had come in the rooms. Um, and impact was this really scary place in Pasadena. At that time, it was a nine to 12 month program, not one of these 28 day buff and shines that I was so enamored of with equine therapy and walks on the beach. And impact had like convicts and people were coming out of prison and it was hardcore like NA. And, and I had heard stories about impact. I knew that I had heard these, you know, that they were gonna shave your head and that they make you dig your own grave with a spoon and you have to wear signs. None of which is true, by the way. May, the signs a little bit, but um, I certainly knew I wasn't going to that place. And I had heard it since day one. And he was like, you need to go to Impact. I'm like, John, I'm not going to Impact. And my sponsor, Joey, came in and he said, Jeff, when you asked me to sponsor you, I asked you if you were willing to go to any lengths for your recovery, and you said you were. I said, I am. He said, and I asked you if you were willing to take direction, and you said you would. I said, I will. He said, okay, go to Impact. I'm like, no. He said, I, th I thought you were willing to go to any lengths. I said, I am willing to go to any lengths, Joey. I'm just not willing to go to Impact. It's not up for discussion. It's not a reality. It's not a possibility. It's not even a distant possibility. Watch. I not going Impact. He's like, let me tell you about Impact. And he just wore me down. And I was like, fine, John. Tell me about Impact. <laughs> he goes, well... It's a six to nine month program. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, that's likely. Okay. He goes, it's in four phases. He said, phase one, you come in, no visitors, no phone calls. Um, you can't touch money and you can't touch an appliance. Okay. He goes, and that goes for 60 to 90 days. I said, wait a minute. Hold on. Back up for a minute. Phase one, 60 to 90 days. He's like, right. I said, no visitors, no phone calls, you can't touch money, you can't touch an appliance. He's like, right. I said, I'll go. He's like, what? I said, I'll go. He goes, are you just fucking with me? I said, no, John, I get it. I'll go to Impact. And I went to Impact. And I had no desire to stay clean. I had no interest in getting clean. I went for one reason, one reason only, which is I knew how scary a place it was. I knew how hardcore they were. And when he told me there was no visitors and no phone calls, I thought, this is where the only place I'm going to be safe from those guys with the vouchers. Because when they find out that those vouchers are bogus, they're going to kill me. And if I'm at impact, I'll be able to survive. And that is the sole reason I went. And I've stayed wow. clean since the day I got there. What year was that? It was uh, September 18th, 1989. Holy shit. <laughs> wow. Okay, you do the whole program of impact. Oh, no, no, no. I got kicked out of impact. Really? I made it 100 days. But the fourth day I was there, I had to write. I went to my uh, caseworker, Raymond. Told him about the tickets. I said, uh, I got to talk to you. Because I remember the, like, the first couple days I was there, I was talking to other residents there. I said, what's this whole caseworker thing? I keep hearing about caseworkers. They said, well, everybody has a caseworker here. It's like your guidance counselor. And they're responsible for you. And they're going to take you through the first three steps. And you meet with them every week. I said, are they cool? I said, yeah, these guys are really cool because you can't work at Impact unless you've been through Impact. So they're all recovering addicts, mm -hmm. uh, except this one guy, Raymond May. Don't get him. He's an asshole. I cut to 20 seconds later, I hear, Jeffrey Jampol, Raymond May's office. <laughs> Fuck. It never ends. And Raymond was this really big black guy who I, I never saw his teeth. Guy never smiled. And he had my number. Raymond May was completely immune to wit, guile, charm, intellect, humor, or manipulation, which are all my horsemen. That's like all I got. And they were like little rubber bullets bouncing off of him. Um, uh, and actually, Raymond and I have been close friends to this day. Um, but at that point, he was my caseworker, and I went to see him, and I was like, I told him the whole story, and he just looked at me, and he's like, all right, sit down. You're going to write a letter to your sponsor telling him that you cheated everybody and you stole their money and the vouchers are bogus. And if you ever stay in the program and you'll make amends to them and, and then we're going to make 17 copies and you're going to, we're going to mail them all to your sponsor and ask them to hand them out at that meeting. Oh, fuck. All right. So I wrote that. 
and they take it away. And then this whole dynamic of me being protected impact completely flipped. So now I'm in the dark. Like, I don't know what's going on out there. I'm certainly, I'm very sure I'm a to topic of conversation. Yeah. But I'm, now I can't get any visitors or phone calls. Um, and then I got kicked out at 100 days for manipulating and bullshitting, of which I was guilty. And that started my long saga of recovery, right? No relapses, though, ever since impact no. day one. No. Wow. Congratulations. I know from numerous scenarios that this is impossible. And obviously God intervened with you, like we said before, because... I mean, well, the trick is the willingness, right? Is they say that the three indispensable spiritual principles are honesty, open mindedness, and willingness. The how. Right. And the key to that really is surrender. Mm -hmm. And there's this really great psychiatric paper that this guy, Harry Tebow, wrote. And the title is Compliance versus Surrender, right? Because I was a complying motherfucker. I never really understood what surrender meant. Right, but once I actually surrendered to the process and just realized I was an addict, but I could stay clean, then it all changed. 1989, you get kicked out, 100 days. Do you have any money at this point? I had $11 and change. What's the first uh, idea you get? Where do you go? I had all my shit in these two plastic trash bags. They, at Impact, they call them plastic Samsonites. <laughs> and uh, I walked up to this liquor store it was about 10 or 12 blocks up, and I changed my money into dimes to make phone calls because phone calls were dime back then. And I'm, I, I got to get a ride from Pasadena. That's, you know, and I literally, four or five hours, I couldn't get a ride. Because, I mean, I had blown away. I had blown out everybody. My family wanted nothing to do with me. Um, I obviously couldn't call any friends from that meeting. Yeah. Um, I finally found this one guy, Ira, and Ira said, okay, I'll come pick you up. Um, you can stay at my house, but you have to leave at 5.30. You have to get up at 5.30. You have to be out of the house by 6 a.m. because I'm going to work. Fine. And I'm still, you know, 425 pounds. I didn't fit on couches. Jesus. So I slept on his floor. And then the next morning, 5.30, wake up. I'm out of there at 6 o'clock. I go to a meeting, and then I just tell people, I just got out of treatment. Um, you know, I have four months clean or whatever I had, um, and I need a place to stay. And I ended up sleeping on floors for over a year, just every day. And sometimes people let me stay two, three, four days. Um, and that's how I started my life again. Onward and upward. Where did you meet Danny Sugarman? I met Danny through some mutual friends, and I was one of the people that helped him get clean again. He had, he had gotten clean and relapsed and gotten clean and relapsed. And I became one of these two or three guys who kind of surrounded him and helped him. Um, we started going to this meeting together. And we became friends. Full circle then, how we began this conversation is Danny hooked you up. He was managing the doors. He had worked Correct. for them for a long time, decades. Then you start co-managing the doors. Right. Instant success. Well, not instant, but big success. And then you use the same method with Janis Joplin. And the doors, the mamas and papas, John Lee Hooker, Coltrane? No, Charlie Parker. Charlie Parker. And um, Jefferson Airplane, Jefferson, Jefferson Starship, Airplane. Starship, Hot Tuna. Juan Gabriel. Wow. Um, I work as an advisor to the Michael Jackson estate. Um, and then I oversee social media for Peter Tosh estate, Rick James estate, Henry Mancini, um, Tennessee Ernie Ford, a couple others. I become an adjunct instructor at UCLA and I, I teach undergrads there. And this is all under the umbrella of your company, which you're the president and founder, Jam. Yeah. I mean, are you just astonished every single day and so grateful that you're even alive? <laughs> yeah. Now, I mean, just uh, I was telling somebody here when earlier, I was like, yeah, I still get imposter syndrome. Like, I feel like the luckiest, most grateful guy ever. Yeah. And I still feel like they're going to find out. You know, again, not sure who they are. Not really sure what they're going to find out since my whole life's pretty much an open book. Yep. I love that about you. That's why I was so, you know, eager to talk to you. But, I mean, everything about the doors is pretty much out there. But, you know, to hear your story, because you're such a figure in this town, and obviously with these legends and rock and roll and the studio here. And I know. How lucky am I? It's incredible. It's simply incredible. It almost brought me to tears. Um, you also had to sue Kendall and Kylie because they were using the door shirt, which goes back to... And Tupac. Uh, oh, they were wearing Tupac shirts? What, thought, what made them think that they could just put these figures on their clothing? That's line? an excellent question. <laughs> <laughs> you should ask them. 
you know, when you're talking about... It was worse than that, actually. What? What they did, and at the time I was also managing the Tupac Shakur estate. Oh, really? I didn't know Yeah, because over time I have managed the Otis Redding estate and uh, Muddy Waters and Tupac Shakur. The biggest and, artist ever. Oh. Um, I still do some work with the Tupac Shakur estate. I no longer manage it. But uh, at that time, what happened was um, they, the, the girls bought these like 100 or 200 vintage T-shirts, so they say. And they would have this picture of Tupac, and they would just superimpose their faces over him. Oh, wow. And they had a picture of Jim Morrison. They would superimpose their faces over it, like just like a stamp on top, and that's what they were selling. Wow. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? You think all the people around them would have say, hey, you can't do that. Oh, and I had the Kurt Cobain estate also, and I think they did Kurt as well. I don't remember that. I remember Tupac on the doors. You know, and I watched your uh, Grammy. You won a Grammy for for pr- producing, yeah, yes. for producing when you're st- when you're strange, a film about the Doors. Uh, so much great unreleased footage that I saw in there it was incredible. We well, got to remember Ray and Jim met at film school. They're filmmakers. Yeah, and the sound design in that was just incredible. Well, again, I have the great luxury of having Bruce Botnick, who's the original mixer co-producer, and Bruce does all of our audio for everything. Yep, he's coming in next week for, uh, they're doing an interview in here with, with uh, I'm sure you know, Robbie and John for... Yeah, for uh, LA Woman. Yep. Um, but what, what or did... Or no, you, that's for Morrison Hotel. Morrison Hotel, yep. What did Ray and the guy say about dealing well, with an alcoholic? Well, they talked about it at length. I mean, and that's one of the things that we talked about in the documentary, you know, is you have to, I think that the key, one of the keys to these kind of, this kind of management is you have to be authentic and credible. You know, and if something happened, you have to talk about it. One of the first discussions I had with um, Janis Joplin's brother and sister, uh, Michael and Laura, I said, you know, she shot dope and she slept with girls, right? And we're going to talk about it. They're like, why? I said, because it's what happened. And again, these artists have magic, right? And so once you start spinning it or editing it or whitewashing it, you have you I think you take a great risk of whitewashing the magic. Because yeah. none of these artists planned their lives, right? It just happened. And so you have to talk about what happened. Um, and we got a lot of stories. And then obviously through 20 years of talking with these guys, Jim was an alcoholic. He wasn't into drugs, by the way. He only had acid a couple of times, right? He had acid a lot, but remember, acid was legal back then. What did Ray and John and Robbie say about those times? It was just drinking and drinking. cocaine towards the end. No, not really. Just no? drinking. I mean, I, everybody who drinks does a little bump here and there, I think. But okay. his main thing was alcohol. In the eyes of recovery, by the way, this is just an aside, you know, um, the, 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 the dragon wakes up, as it were, when you ingest a mind-altering substance. Anything mind-altering. So there is literally, there is no difference between um, a sip of liqueur at Aunt Ida's or a beer or shooting meth in your uh, jugular vein. They're all equal. Uh It's all ingesting a mind-altering substance. So we don't say he's a cocaine addict, he's a Demerol addict, it's just he's an addict. Then that's his drug of choice, but... It's like talking to someone who's 500 pounds or three different guys who are all weigh 500 pounds and one of them saying, well, I'm a cheeseburger and fries guy. And the one's like, no, nah, I'm pizza and garlic bread. And the other one's like, I don't understand you guys. I'm a hot fudge <laughs> guy. It's just, it's all fat. We don't really care. It's all calories. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they tried to talk to Jim a lot. And, you know, it's it's got to be such a difficult position because Jim is the leader of the band. I mean, he's the front man. He's the... He's writing a lot of the lyrics, although Robbie's writing the majority of the singles. Um, and he's got the band in his grip unintentionally, and his, his, his alcoholism has got the band in its grip. And I've had many talks with John and Ray about it, and Robbie, and John's like, yeah, you know, AA wasn't really prevalent then. People didn't talk about it. It was still, you know, these older guys meeting in the linoleum floored rooms kind of in secret. It was still very underground. Uh Um, And John says, yeah, I mean, if if AA had been more in the forefront then, could we have saved Jim's life? They didn't really have rehabs back then. The first kind of rehab was what they called a therapeutic community, which really, which was Synanon, which still wasn't 12 step based. And it wasn't, you know, it was based on behavior modification. It was here in Santa Monica. Um, And it was all kinds of wackiness. 
but out of that model really became this modern, you know, rehab model or treatment facility. They didn't really have a lot of that back then. Um, and so there wasn't a lot people could do. But really, Jim Morrison, he was a good looking guy. He was out of control. And towards the end of the, of the concerts and stuff, people were going there just to see how crazy he would go. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that's basically accurate. You know, and because remember, the, the disease of addiction is progressive. Right. And so, you know, Jim, when they started first formed in 1965, I'm sure his disease wasn't nearly as progressive as it was by 1971. Yeah. Um, but yeah, one of the things that, that he talked about and that the guys have talked about is that after a while, people were coming to their concerts to see spectacle. Yep. Right. But again, you know, you got to remember, they, Jim had been infamously busted at Dinner Key Auditorium in Miami in 69. They had an entire world tour planned that got, you know, the, 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 the um, venue owners had a society back then and they just decided to ban the doors from all these venues. So they couldn't really tour again until 1970. Yeah. Um, that Miami show was the first city in the tour too, correct. right? Yeah. <laughs> so it's like right off the bat, you're done. Right. Well, and you, you know, before that, you know, Jim, Jim was very into breaking through you know, the bounds of conformity, of, of seeing where, you know, your perception could go. Remember, he was a great acolyte of Blake and Huxley and Balzac and Baudelaire, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, you know, the name of the band came from that great William Blake quote where he said, if the doors of perception were cleansed, then man would see things as they truly are, infinite. Which, And from that quote, Aldous Huxley named his book the doors of perception mm -hmm. and so for jim it, it was a mixture of art and theater and music and remember jim was a film major he got his degree in film he did he, i thought he didn't drop out no oh, wow no jim got he didn't show up for his diploma uh -huh. no ray got his ma his mfa his masters in fine arts and jim got his bachelor's from ucla from ucla um and they they uh, they were um benefits there are benefactors of really exquisite timing because when they came out to go to film school it was right at the advent of the nouvelle vogue and so these guys they knew you know bertolucci and fellini and varda and kurosawa and you know Josef von sternberg graded ray's thesis um uh, uh coppola was there at the same time um it was a real vibrant time to be in film and and Film was, at that point, you know, it was very artistic, especially like a lot of these foreign directors. A, a, a film was an art piece. Yeah. Um, it wasn't a document. It was Polanski, more of an art piece. That was... And so, yeah. And and G there was a Julian uh, Beck, actually his mother, I think. I forget her name, but there was this thing called the Living Theater. And the Living Theater was this theater... It was this theater troupe that broke down the fourth wall, as they call it. And you would go to these performances and they would walk into the audience and they would prod at you and they would yell at things at you and challenge you. And sometimes they would be fully nude. And it was a very provocative form of theater. And they actually came to L.A. and had four performances. And I'm told Jim Morrison was at all four of them. Yeah. And then the next night, Miami. And so the guys seemed to think that he was decided to try and do that kind of living theater provocation. Wow. He also happened to be, you know, shit drunk. Yep. Um, Had missed two flights before the Miami show. Correct. And obviously, uh, When You're Strange, if you haven't seen that, it's amazing. You can, it's available on Google Play and YouTube and Amazon. Amazon Prime. That was, it was fascinating. You would lecture at UCLA about, the music business. Well, I teach the one of the required courses for the music business degree, which they were now offering at UCLA, music industry and history. Um, and I teach marketing and branding. Did you do that in part to give back as well? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Plus I love it. I love teaching. And I actually, I taught at UCLA Extension for, I think, 19 years. Oh, well, really? I didn't know that. And then uh, my big dream was one of my two great anarchistic achievements was I want to be able to go back and be a professor at college, even though I'm a dropout. It's like if I could actually teach undergrads for a credit to be a real guy. And they finally made me an instructor, an undergrad instructor. And so now I teach these classes 
to undergrads. Um, the other great anarchistic achievement for me was um, I'm today I'm the president of the Board of Impact. Oh my gosh. <laughs> the place that kicked me out. Um, yeah, and it's great. So I love giving back there. It's, it's not a paid position, it's a volunteer position, but I've been serving uh, Impact's board for about 12, 13 years. For people listening to this and you know, people that want to get in the music industry, what's the first thing to do with being a manager? Attach yourself to a band, start working for free? What would you give just briefly? There's think? really, I think there's probably a lot of ways to go about it. The two main uh, paths I've seen that tend to work uh, is one is, you know, you start developing an artist on your own. But that's a no-win path in, in my estimation because only one of two things can happen. Is one is the band will never be successful, and so you will remain the manager of an unsuccessful band forever. Or the band will become successful, and you'll be immediately poached by a big manager. So one way you lose band, and the other way you keep band, but <laughs> you don't want to get, you know. Yeah. Um, the other way I've seen is to, which works really well, is to become an intern. You work for free. You know, and you you hang out and you get somebody's dry cleaning and fetch coffee and set up meeting rooms and throw away trash and uh, run errands and pick up tapes at the studio and go there and pick up these photos. But, you know, you're sitting around and you're listening to these managers and you're learning. Um, that's how we teach people in my business. Yeah. Um, and that leads to great careers. One of the things I try and do for my students at UCLA is help them find key meaningful internships, including with my company. Yeah, jam pull management or 360 or someplace that's going to be. Uh, or a label or a publisher yeah. or, you know, wherever. Well, everybody wants to start at the top, though. So. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> I want a dream date with Margot Robbie, but she's married. Does uh, today's youth care about these legends with the doors, Grace Slick, or do they just care about wearing a shirt like we discussed earlier? Well, it's interesting. I think going back to the original question you asked me, which is how do we market these legacies? which is this. You have to understand there are two distinct marketing bases, right? One are your existing fans who are great for three reasons. Number one, they've always supported you, right? And they'll continue to support whatever it is you're doing. Um, and then number three is they are really effective passers of the baton. And they'll turn on their nieces, nephews, sons, daughters, yeah. neighbors, et cetera. They're also a not-so-great marketing base for four other distinct reasons, which is, number one, they're tiny compared to the number of potential new fans out there. And by the way, they're making about 100 million potential new fans every year. Um, number two is they're saturated. You know, they went to the show, they got the, the, the T-shirt, they, they have five albums, you know, and, and giving them the very best of the greatest hits, volume three, and a never-before-seen sequence is not my idea of cutting-edge marketing. Um, they're, they're shrinking through natural attrition and, and death because their median age is basically near death. Uh, and number four is uh, the older you skew demographically, the less amount of money you spend on music. Hmm. Um, and you have the, le the least amount of disposable income, which seems counterintuitive. But like a 20-year-old usually doesn't have st stuff like credit card debt and mortgages and kids in college. That older yeah. people have, so the, the you know a younger person tends to have more disposable income. Um, anyway, so we, the, my opinion, my feeling is that um, what we want to do, the goal here is to put the idea of this artist, to put this artist back in the pop culture conversation today, in a way that's authentic and credible and meaningful to an eleven to thirty year old. And if I can do that, then I just let the magic do its work. You know, Danny Sugarman said something to me like in 1998, I never forget it. He said, you know, I've watched this for like 30 years. He said, you just put Jim Morrison in front of kids, they'll react every time. And it's true. What do you think the number one reason is for that? The anti-authority, he's extremely good looking, his voice? Yes. All three? Well, and probably 20 more. Yeah. That's part of the magic. You know, and I already know what the percentiles are going to be. I know if I put it in front of 100 new people, I know how many new fans I'm going to get. I know how many quasi fans I can get. I know how many casual fans I'm going to get. So the path is there. 
And there's something else very counterintuitive, which is most people's instinct is to go, okay, let's figure out where they left off and we'll just carry on. No, we're going to go back to the beginning. We're going to recreate it. We're going to do exactly what the Doors did in 1967. We're just going to do it in 2022. Well, that's cool. Right? Yep. Except we're going to do it in a way that's meaningful and credible and authentic to an 11 to 30 year old, just like they did in 1967. And if you are credible and authentic, then all of the existing fans will come right along with you and you get both. You know, it's, uh, I look at someone like you that manages these artists and I'm almost grateful to you because uh, I help them bring it to light. Yeah, yeah. That's what a good manager does and, and like, knowing what to do with it. Not just with the licensing stuff, but you're really preserving this music and you're letting it still stay alive. What we're trying to do in this studio, like I mentioned earlier, is, you know, we're keeping the history alive. We're entertaining it because that this is the greatest, I think. In, of the okay, well, industry. then you understand the concept of what I talked about earlier, which is Sunset Sound is not just a collection of gear. Yep. Sunset Sound has magic. Yep. Right? Um, Janis Joplin is, just, is not just a bunch of songs and a vocal track. Janis Joplin has magic. There's something much deeper and more meaningful. Think about the magic that's happened in these walls. Uh, you know, we, we have not dissimilar paths. Yeah. Um, but thank you for the compliment. And I think it's critical that this stuff has to be protected and defended and also promoted and carried forward. Because if it doesn't move, it dies. Exactly. Right. The analogy that I always use in my company is that having a pop culture legacy, whether it's Sunset Sound or John Lee Hooker, is it's like walking up a down escalator. So if you're standing still, you're not standing still. You're moving backward. Yep. And if you think about some of the pop culture icons that have slipped completely off the escalator, it scares the shit out of me. Name one. Bob Hope. Ben Crosby. Yep. Jackie Gleason. Gone. Gone. Think about how important Bing Crosby or Bob or how many hundreds of millions of records Bing Crosby sold. He's completely gone off the escalator. And to get him, it would take so many thousands of hours and millions of dollars even to get him back to the bottom first or second step. It will never be efficient. What 14-year-old will ever care about Bing Crosby? Yeah. Wow. They're gone. That's so Next up, Groucho Marx. Next up, Cab Calloway. Next up, Who? Who runs uh, the Jimi Hendrix estate? The family? Jimi Hendrix estate, we're very friendly with them. Uh, they help us a lot. We help them a lot. It's run by Jimmy's sister, Janie, and a, a wonderful guy named John McDermott, who was originally a journalist and became a Jimi Hendrix expert and has worked with Janie um, for, gosh, probably 25 years. Maybe more. Did you uh, run Muddy Waters as well? I did. I used to manage the Muddy Waters estate. I'm from Chicago, obviously. Chess Records and all that. It's yeah. just uh, Buddy Guy, all those guys. I know you got to get going here. Um, I have 200 questions. I just, I think it's so admirable how open you are, obviously, about your recovery. Because, you know, even in this studio, I was just thinking when you were telling those stories, it's like every great artist, Prince, died of a drug overdose. Yeah. Jim Morrison, uh, it wasn't an overdose, but obviously a complications from his, his lifestyle. Yeah. Um, you know, this room, Eddie Van Halen, just destroyed his body with all the drugs and the alcohol over just decades. And tobacco. And nobody talks about that stuff, kind of like on this kind of format, you know, this kind of platform. Well, I think there's a lot of people that do and that are starting to, and I think it's about breaking through that clutter. Um, although... As we say in recovery, it's about attraction rather than promotion. Um, and I really stand for trying to help people who are suffering from the disease of addiction. Like the thing, I've had dates with girls and I have to explain to them. I'm like, listen, I love drugs and alcohol. They're awesome. That's why I did them. Yeah. You know, and the fact is I have this allergy. I have this disease of addiction, right? It doesn't make, um, it, that doesn't make drugs evil. Like, I also happen to be deathly allergic to peanuts. It doesn't make Jif evil. It doesn't mean you shouldn't enjoy a Snickers. Like, if I could do a white wine spritzer with you right now, I would, because I remember alcohol tasted pretty good. Um, but I can't. I also, you have your white wine spritzer and your Butterfinger, and I look at them both equally. But for those who have a problem or have uh, are suffering from that disease of addiction, I want to be able to be there to help them. Let them know that there's hope, that they don't have to live that way anymore. 
they don't ever have to use again, that there's a whole cadre of people who will help them and surround them for fun and for free. It doesn't cost them a penny. And we'll walk through every step of the way with them. All right, let me get through a couple more questions. Uh, thoughts about NFTs for music artists? It's a fad? Yeah, I mean, this is, we're already after the fact. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> I love that answer. I got to tell Paul that too. What's a rock band that just came out that you like? Um, none. Exactly. Well, there's only probably two or three rock bands. I well, think there's Dorothy, there's Foo Fighters, and there's um, Greta Van Fleet. Greta Van Fleet is Led Zeppelin Light. I said it. You know, it's funny. Robbie, I was talking to Robbie about that. He's played with them before. Really? And he said, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of the Doors influence in them. I think they're going to find their own voice. What's your favorite Doors song? Uh, I'd have to boil it down to three. Um, I would say um, When the Music's Over, L.A. Woman, um, and it's a tie between The End and Soul Kitchen. I just happen to love Soul Kitchen. Yeah, those are actually probably mine. But definitely when the music's over, Soul Kitchen is the... Dun, but the dun, end. Dun, 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 yeah. Dun. Mm. Dun, 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 dun. But the end, I mean, it's such an epic. I can't leave it out. So I would have to say the end when the music's over in L.A. Woman. Five to one is also a great I mean, mind. yeah. Do you know Jack Holtzman very well? I love Jack. Nice. That's what everybody says. I want to interview him as well. What an amazing man that guy is. Yeah. Just pleasure. So smart and sharp and experienced and, and distinguished and a gentleman and brilliant. We were just talking to um, Danny White a few days ago who owns Sound Techniques, which he says Jack's been such an incredible help because they've, uh, there was a Sound Techniques console in here and then they put one in Electra on La Cienega. Oh, right. Um, and that's obviously that footage you have of them, of the Doors performing in there. That's all on that uh, Sound Techniques board. What, what's in the old Electra records on La Cienega? I don't know. I would love to go in there and see what. The, Let's go. All right. <laughs> Are you just um, excited about the future? Uh, I'm. Are you very, on autopilot? No, I'm super excited about the future, and I think I think this is one of the greatest times to be in the music business ever because there's so much possibility on the horizon. We're splitting off in a hundred different directions in many different dimensions and i think the possibilities are going to be endless and i think they're going to come really quick i think we've already surpassed moore's law which is technology doubles every two years yeah i think we're already beyond that um so what's going to happen with delivery what's going to happen with consumption what's going to happen with the way people enjoy music and live i just it's oh my god what a great time to get in this business i'm that. really really excited for my students i'm really excited for young people coming in Oh, it's going to be amazing. That's awesome. I love that. Do you have bad days? Um, I have bad moments. I don't really have bad days uh, anymore. Um, but yeah, I have moments of frustration and irritability um, and wisps of sadness. But they're just moments. Yeah. And the program teaches you also how to deal with those things. Uh, yeah, you know, I have tools. I have a really great spiritual toolkit. Um, so are we going to do the Doors 50th for LA Woman here at Sunset? Let's close down the strip, and then we're going to have, I say, a concert in the back parking lot. We clear it all out, put a stage up. Yeah, that would be great. We're, we're working on something. All right. Can we talk about the book, the Jim Morrison sure. book with the unreleased poetry? Just give me, uh, briefly tell me that amazing story, though, how... Or what was in the storage unit? Was it a storage unit? Yeah, it was a storage facility, uh, protected. Uh, there was uh, 26 or 27 completely filled in handwritten journals and another 500 to 1,000 loose sheets of paper and all the masters and negative prints for uh, the film Highway and shooting script and a bunch of ephemera. And who was under control of that? The Corson family? Well, it's owned equally by the Corsons and the Morrisons. Um, it was originally put into a vault by the Corson family, and then the families came together, and uh, we spent years going through all of that stuff. Um, luckily, you know, we had Frank Lisiandro, who was one of Jim's best friends, who was with him everywhere, and Frank was able to edit and to help us explain and give context to a lot of the writings. And now, is the book released? Yeah, the book just came out last week. Yep. What's um, the name of it? It's called The Collected Works of Jim Morrison. It's on HarperCollins. 
and the audiobook is coming out shortly, which I think we have, I know we have Patty Smith doing some reading, some Jim's doing some of his own reading. Yeah, because there was um, audio tapes in there too, right? No, those are available in the audiobook. Okay. And I think they're, we're putting, I think we're doing a separate CD package of just the audio version. Incredible. Do you guys ever run out of ways to market artists? Like, okay, I'll let you this. know. <laughs> I mean, look, that's the artists make it easy. Yeah. They, they really inspire us. You know, I mean, you know, I mean, every time we're like patting ourselves on the back for some really great creative plan, I tell my staff, you know, dude, you could be doing this for, you know, whoever, the Kingsman. Um, I mean, it is Jim Morrison. It is Janis Joplin. What's the most accurate book of people, if there's an 18-year-old kid that wants to learn about the Doors, what do you, what's your favorite Doors book? Well, favorite and accurate are two different things. Okay. Um, I, can't t I can't opine on accurate because I wasn't there. The, the book I would definitely start with is No One Here Gets Out Alive. Yeah. And then I would read Ray's book. Yep. And I would read John's book, Writers in the Storm. And then Robbie's coming with his book later this year. Oh, amazing. Called Set the Night on Fire. Set the Night on Fire. That's the first book he's, he's ever never read. talked to. And boy, he talks about everything. Yeah. He talks about everything, including his own battles with addiction and his family and incredible stuff that I, I mean, I read so many stories I had never heard. He really lays it out. These things need to be documented. That's why I want to do this show in here, just because right. they have to be put down. And what if Robbie, are. you know, he's getting older. What if he passed away without anyone knowing? And it right. Just goes that away. happens. We have interview subjects that pass away during filming of documentaries. Wow. Our history is vanishing. And it's not only to preserve history, but to make it, put it in context and make it current again. Because great art is timeless. Yep. 100%. I appreciate your time so much. Uh, I mean, the association's here, but I was really just fascinated with learning about you, and it's very inspiring, and I hope other people can, you know, if they're having problems with addiction, there's a way out. Yeah, thanks. It was great. I, I didn't expect the conversation to go in that direction, but 100% happy that it did. Yeah, this is about you, not the doors. I mean, it's what you work <laughs> My with. My favorite but. topic. <laughs> <laughs> Let me finish with wisdom comes from good judgment. Good judgment comes from experience. And experience comes from really bad judgment. All right. I love that. It's great. Jeff Jampol, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having Shoot. me.